Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 101, the first Dry Dock that you should listen to when you're starting US University class apparently. Anyway, this week's Dry Dock is of course the Patreon Dry Dock and there's an accompanying Patreon live stream. Uh, Patreon Dry Dock live stream with the alternate history style questions uh, that was, well, by the time you're listening to this, it should have been streamed on Friday. So this week, Manani Wanderer leads off the questions with, what would you consider to be the best examples of ships that were killed by committee from each era? And was any navy particularly unlucky as to have an inordinate amount of such ships? Yes, yeah, ships designed by committee are a perennial curse of pretty much any navy that's built any substantial number of ships. Now, for those of you who've seen the Guide to the St. Louis class, you'll be aware that that is probably one of the worst examples of a ship designed by committee, at least in the era of steel and guns, for the US Navy, being as it is effectively a, almost twice the size of USS Olympia, and a well-crewed Olympia could probably beat it in a fight. But there are others. The Royal Navy had the misfortune to be visited by Design by Committee on numerous occasions, but one of the most obvious ones to stand out is actually the Defence Class Ironclads from the 1860s. Now, bearing in mind that the Royal Navy had already launched Warrior and Black Prince, and was well on its way to building a number of other fairly substantial ironclads, as well as converting wooden warships into ironclads, and then it was decided that these revolutionary warships were far too expensive, and instead everybody should try and design a smaller ironclad that would be able to do all the job of the bigger ironclad except on a smaller hull, and therefore cost less, and so the Royal Navy could keep building the numbers of ships it wanted, and the Treasury could basically hand out money in shillings and pence rather than in bundles of pounds. And so you got the defence class, which turned out to be small, short range, not particularly heavily armed, and in fact, as might not come as the world's greatest shock, worse protected and worse armed than ships the Royal Navy, the French Navy, and one or two others were already building. And so, yeah, that was that was pretty much a dumb move. The the defence class, to be fair, were still for fairly capable warships if they were fighting wooden warships that weren't armed with the latest weapons, which well, there were a fair few of still, but it's an ironclad, and they also ended up costing almost as much as the bigger and much better ones anyway. And if you're wondering if French pre dreadnoughts were going to make this list, well, yes, they definitely are. The French uh, fleet of experiments, as they were so lovingly called, was one of the worst cases of design by committee since, well, as the name suggests, a committee sat and decided on all the major specifications without any actual thought as to whether this would be something that would result in an achievable battleship of any particular capability. And the answer was, in fact, no. Um, and then, almost to cap it all off, not only did they design the ship specifications by committee, but they then, in a typical French pre-dreadnought fashion, decided to let each individual shipyard make their own minor modifications to it, which resulted in said fleet of experiments theoretically consisting of a few one-offs and a couple of classes, but in reality consisting of a whole load of very slightly different ships. And the differences, whilst in some cases appeared to be slight, were just enough to basically render each one its own unique maintenance nightmare. Alfred Mullet asks, Had the Royal Navy went ahead and built the Leopard-class battlecruisers to go with the Queen Elizabeths, complete with 15-inch guns, etc., would they have been a good potential survivor of the naval treaties? And also, would they have been as useful as the Renowns were in World War II? So what exactly a Leopard class might actually have been is a very difficult question. I mean, whether or not it would even have been called Leopard is in and of itself open to a question. And a lot of this information is very speculative, largely on the basis of there being a rather odd gap in the design history of the Royal Navy. The documents appear to be either lost, destroyed, or concealed well enough that nobody's found them yet. But to give you some idea... The Iron Dukes, which obviously the last generation of Royal Navy capital ships before the Queen Elizabeth's, were Design M4, 
the Queen Elizabeths were the final version of design R3. So there are immediately, obviously, four letters in between, N, O, P, and Q. Although apparently O wasn't in use at the time as a design designation, although it later would be around the time of the 1920s, but never mind. So we're left with N, P, and Q. What were these designs? We don't know for certain. We can try and piece things together from later references to designs that didn't make the final drawing board, such as a heavier, slower version of the Queen Elizabeth that was basically the Iron Dukes except scaled up. So that would have had 10, 15 inch guns, including a gun in Q turret, and that extra turret would have meant less machinery space, which would have meant less speed. So that leaves two other designs that are open to question. Now we know one of them was supposed to just be a, a further evolution of the Iron Duke design. So whatever letter we want to sign that to. And that leaves the very last one as our theoretical slot where a potential quote unquote leopard class could have sat. Now what we do know about what was at least being petitioned for by certain people like Admiral Fisher, um, who at the time was not quite back in power yet, was a ship that would be able to reach at least 28 knots. It would have to be armed with 15-inch guns, and it would, according to what evidence can be pieced together, be designed to be better protected than Seidlitz, which was at the time the latest German battlecruiser that the Royal Navy knew anything about. Now, with Seidlitz armoured with as near as much as makes no difference, 12 inches of armour, if this ship is going to be better armoured than that, then that means either an inclined belt, which is relatively unlikely immediately pre-World War I, or just a thicker belt. And considering that Queen Elizabeth had a 13-inch belt, it seems relatively likely that they also would have had this protection, largely on the basis of economy, to be perfectly honest, because if they're designing battleships and battle cruisers at the same time, it would make a certain amount of sense to just be able to have a commonality of armour plate production, you know, economies of scale and all that. Now, obviously, as we know, they ended up going with, in theory, six, but ending up with five Queen Elizabeths, which were kind of a halfway house where they were faster than the average battleship, but not as fast as a battle cruiser. And so I suspect if this particular class of theoretical battle cruiser had gone ahead, it would not have gone ahead with the Queen Elizabeth as we historically know them, because given the reasoning at the time that the Queen Elizabeths were blending the speed of some battle cruisers with the armament of battle and protection of battleships, there's no reason to have a slightly different version of that. What I suspect would have been the case is if they'd gone with the more heavily armed Queen Elizabeth style design, i.e. the one with the 10 15 inch guns in five twin turrets and the commensurate reduction in speed, then you would have possibly seen some kind of theoretical uh, leopard type battle cruiser. We might as well call it leopard. Um, because that would follow a fairly logical scheme when you look at all the other British battle cruisers that had been built recently, where you basically removed a turret and increased machinery power and that was kind of the starting point of your design. So you can kind of see that when you look at the Lion, Princess Royal, Queen Mary, and Tiger. Now, obviously, there are other differences, especially with Tiger, but that's generally the, the basis of it. So at that point, eight 15-inch guns, and going by the other stats, 28 knots plus 13-inch armor. That would have been a ferocious opponent, to be perfectly honest. Um, assuming that they didn't do something silly like really n narrow down the areas of the citadel protected by the armour or make the armour belt particularly um, short in terms of height, but let let's assume that they're having a decent day. If those get built, you're effectively kind of looking at a slightly smaller proto-hood, um, and before you all start getting up in arms about hood blowing up, just, just don't. Um, but if those ships had been built, and if they then gone over into naval treaty land, this would have immediately allowed the Royal Navy to standardise its battle line. If they'd built a few of these, then between 
well, assuming that the revenge class goes ahead, there's no guarantee it would in this scenario, but assuming the revenge, revenge class goes ahead, between that the renowns, these things, and the Queen Elizabeth, the Royal and Hood, the Royal Navy would probably have more than enough 15 inch gun ships to just immediately standardize on the 15 inch gun as their standard battle line weapon. Now, the interesting part comes when the Royal Navy then has to downscale its fleet further. I mean, they probably would have got Nelson and Rodney as well in the 20s, but when you get to the historic point where they're having to decommission. First, the King George V class of the World War I ones, and then the Iron Dukes. The Royal Navy is left with a bit of a quandary because you would have these very heavily armed but somewhat slow Queen Elizabeths. You'd have possibly the Revengers. Again, we don't know exactly if that would occur, but let's assume for the ease of argument that it did. You'd have Renown and Repulse, and then you'd have an unknown number of these Leopards. I think at that point the revenge class would probably be the ones on the block because they'd be marginally faster or possibly similar in speed to the these new different Queen Elizabeths but they would have less firepower and the battle cruisers these leopards have similar protection much greater speed and and the same firepower as the revengers so the Revengers would probably go, which would mean the Royal Navy would actually enter the 1930s and possibly World War II with a theoretically slightly battlecruiser-heavy fleet. And the interesting part would be what would they then do with it, because the Queen Elizabeths, n now with these 10-gun versions, are going to be much slower, much less uh, useful on the front line, but on the other hand, these 28-plus knot ships are actually more useful on the front line, a lot more, possibly even more, a lot more useful than the Renowns, because they've got an extra turret and a lot more armor. They are a little bit slower, but then that would actually put them in prime position to be modernized, much as the Queen Elizabeth historically were, and pump them full of modern machinery, pop them up to 30, 31 knots, and yeah, all of a sudden things start to look very grim for very many... Um, <laughs> historical opponents. It's an interesting scenario to think about. Paul Goyne asks, a majority of post-World War I battleship designs used inclined armour belts, but the angle they used varied wildly. How did other how did designers select an angle and were some angles better than others? So there are advantages and disadvantages to angled armour versus kind of vertical slab sided armour, but that's a question for another time. So we'll just look at, we've decided we're going with the inclined armour, right now how do we choose an angle? This still has to do with the positives and negatives of it, but specifically with regards to, to the choice of angle. The main issues are how thin are you making your armour as a result? Because one of the biggest drawbacks of sloped armour is that it's heavier per vertical foot of protection. Because effectively, if you imagine a right angle triangle, which you're creating with the, the vertical side of the hull and the inclined angle of the armour, you're trying to armour the hypotenuse instead of the long edge. Therefore, you're armouring a greater surface area. And therefore, for the same thickness you're, of armour, you're going to have more weight. And one of the trade-offs you can do is to thin down the armour as compared to a vertical piece of slab armour, which mitigates the weight somewhat, but at closer ranges where the angle has less impact on penetration, there you're then much less well protected. So this is one of the first trade-offs when it comes to thinking about your angle. The steeper you angle your armour, the better protected you are against long-range fire, but the heavier your armour is going to be. So that's factor one. Factor two is whether you've got internal or external armour. If you've got external armour, then that means that your hull is going to be wider at the top of your armour than it is at the bottom. This does have stability issues unless you put substantial bulging underneath, which in turn, again, affects the angle that you might choose, because, again, greater angle, 
greater protection at long range, but potentially more stability issues to cope with. If it's internal, you have the problem that the armour is cutting into what would otherwise be, depending on whereabouts vertically on the armour belt you are, either usable space within the ship or your torpedo defence system uh, when you get further down. Neither of which is particularly attractive, uh, but again, angle it more severely, better protection, but you're losing more space and compromising your torpedo defence system more. So you might want to shallow it out to reduce that effect. So those are the major effects. There are a number of other secondary issues that you might also want to take into account, but at the end of the day, <laughs> that would probably be a whole video just on the comparison between vertical and angled armour. So with those in mind, this is what goes through each designer's head when they're choosing their angles. I say overall, if you want absolute better protection against incoming shell fire, particularly at long range, you want a steeper angle. But every degree you increase that angle, you impart various other negatives to yourself. So each designer has to weigh those in the balance and come up with some kind of compromise. And that's going to depend on all sorts of other issues, not just the ones we mentioned, but things like hydrodynamics, hull form, overall size of the ship, extent of the armour protection, what's behind it, what's in front of it, if it's internal, etc, etc. So, yeah, this is why you have this range of angles where some people are like, oh, well, I can live with this many degrees of angled armour leading to these compromises, but I can't live with anything further. Others will go a bit bit beyond that others will go a bit less than that but somewhere between 10 and 20 degrees is where everybody seems to have decided is something approaching an acceptable compromise angle daryl smith asks what is your opinion of u.s admiral harold stark he always struck me as being a fine commander but had his career handicapped due to the unforgivable character traits of normal sized ego and a lack of narcissism so the first thing that tripped my radar and think, oh, I might not actually like this man when I was looking at his career was, oh, look, he was head of the Bureau of Ordnance or Buord for most of the 1930s. However, he lucks out in that regard in only being in charge of it after they developed the Mark 14 and leaving that command before they started messing around the US sailors who were saying it was broken. So he gets off on that one. Um, then... Of course, he is Chief of Naval Operations for a while. There is a whole controversy there as to him and his subordinates, whether there was enough information passed on to the commanders at Pearl Harbor, who was responsible for what, etc., etc., etc. But that, um, whilst it initially went against him later on in uh, towards the end of World War II when they did an investigation, um, in what's called the only time that Admiral King admitted that he was wrong... Uh, King actually withdrew his endorsement of that particular report afterwards and thus basically pulled the rug out from under the people who wanted to blame Admiral Stark. So, again, um, swings around us. The fact that the, such questions were quite seriously considered is a black mark, but at the same time, if Admiral King can admit that he's wrong in saying that Stark is guilty, then well, that, that carries a fair bit of weight, to be perfectly honest. Um, now, when King took over from Stark, Stark was head, headed over to Europe to work with the various Allied navies. And to be fair, in that case, he seems to have been in some ways very similar to Admiral North at Western Approaches Command in that whilst he may not have been a kind of a standout admiral who gets a lot of praise like uh, Fletcher or Spruance or Halsey, questionably, um, or Nimitz, he made things work. He managed to get compromises going. He managed to hold alliances and cooperation together. And he managed, therefore, to get a fair bit of cooperation between the various free navies, the Royal Navy and the US Navy, when it came to operations all in the European theatre. And there were a lot, remember. There was 
aircraft ferrying to Malta, then there was the Operation Torch landings, then there was the landings in Italy, and then there was D-Day. All of these are very important joint operations, and there were further ones after that, the invasion of southern France, for example. And so for him to be able to keep all that running, especially as countries were liberated and various national interests began to diverge a lot further than they were when Europe was entirely occupied, well, near enough, uh, by the Nazis, that takes a certain amount of skill. So I would say that if we forgive him for having anything to do with 1930s Bjord, and if we put aside for a minute the, the controversy about uh, Pearl Harbor, his actual contribution to the war effort, I would say, stands as being one of those officers who you don't hear all that much about, but is kind of like the glue that holds the Allied framework together, and therefore probably deserves a bit more recognition than he otherwise gets these days. Trey Atkins asks, At what point did technology advance to the point that submarines hunting submarines became feasible, and what were the most famous examples of this? So it depends how you define submarines hunting other submarines. In theory, in absolute terms, it was feasible right from the start of the first submarine becoming operational. Well, as soon as there was a second one for it to hunt, anyway. Because submarines up until the dawn of nuclear power needed to surface quite regularly and recharge their batteries, and a surface submarine is basically just a slightly smaller and harder to hit target compared to anything else that a hunting submarine might engage. And there were quite a number of cases in both the First and Second World Wars of various submarines being sunk by other submarines that caught them on the surface and torpedoed them. There's, I mean, it's still fairly rare as a cause of loss, but there's a, there's a fair number of cases on, in both wars. Now, in terms of submarines hunting submarines underwater, the main issue is how do you track your target. Um, before the advent of homing torpedoes, there's also the fact you're, you're well, not blind firing, but you're firing a straight running weapon in a 3D environment. I mean, it's, it's hard enough to hit something that's on, uh, you know, relatively speaking, at the 2D environment of being s stuck on the surface, let alone in, in allowing for depth as well. But the first time this became actually viable was Actually, believe it or not, in World War One, with the advent of hydrophones, gives, gives a good chance for me to trot out the R-class submarine again, um, the Royal Navy's version, that is. Now, these were designed to hunt enemy submarines, the idea being that you would use a big hydrophone array in the front of the sub, you'd listen and follow basically in the same manner that passive sonar does these days, and then you'd shotgun uh, an eight torpedo salvo into the water and hope that you hit something. Now, interestingly enough, assuming that there aren't any Cold War shenanigans that need to be declassified at some point, there have, in recorded history so far, only been two submarine versus submarine underwater engagements, one in the First World War and one in the Second World War, both involving Royal Navy versus U-boats. In the First World War, reportedly, one of the R-class managed to track a U-boat, shotgunned its torpedoes, and hit it, but the torpedo failed to explode. In the Second World War, however, we do have a more confirmed case, albeit it took place at relatively shallow depths, but still technically underwater, uh, which was HMS Aventurer versus U-864. And Venturer was actually stalking U-864 based on intercepted German transmissions, and whilst they were both underwater, Ventura fired a spread of four torpedoes at where they thought the U-boat was going to be, based on periscope observations and, again, listening passively. U-864 did manage to evade three torpedoes, but that evasion pattern carried it straight into the fourth, which was pretty much what Ventura had been counting on, and that was the end of U-864. So, yeah, it's surprisingly early for the potential for underwater sub versus sub engagements, but as I say, barring any disclosures of Cold War shenanigans at some point in the future, the only confirmed underwater versus underwater submarine kill took place right at the end of the Second World War. Although it was only a faulty fuse that stops that from being a First World War achievement.
Koos Army 0001 asks, You've often said that the longest lead item on a Dreadnought was the main guns. Presumably this was not so much the case in the Age of Sail, although obvious care in production was needed, as John Paul Jones learned. At what point did the production of main guns become complex enough that they became the first item on a ship to begin production? So this is one of those questions that has a kind of an era that you can point to, but not a specific answer. Now, the era that you're looking at is when guns get up to fairly large calibers, so something over about 10, 11 inches, and they start to become rifled because cutting the rifling on a large caliber gun is one of, if not the most time intensive processes for gun production. So you're looking at the start of the period being somewhere in the 1870s in some cases. Now, obviously, there were some fairly large smoothbore guns cast at the time, but making a gun that's a smoothbore is one step down from making the rifled gun because effectively you make the same gun except with the rifled gun you then, well, rifle it. Um, that's a very crude way of, of, de of describing it, but hey, we've only got a certain amount of time per question. <laughs> now, the thing is that ship production times also increased because ships got bigger and more complex. So a early say a rifled muzzle loader might take fractionally longer than the ship that it was being mounted on to produce but then as the, the next generation of ships got larger they might then take longer to build than a short barreled rifled muzzle loader you then get into uh, rifled breech loaders you then also um, obviously ships continue to expand in complexity and technology and so there, there's kind of this race going on between length of construction of ships and length of construction of guns although the guns are starting to pull ahead in terms of that so the big deciding factor really is when new powders new shell designs new metallurgy etc allow for the guns to become longer because if you thought cutting the rifling on a 25 or 30 caliber barrel was difficult wait till you try it on a 40 or 45 caliber barrel so I'd say when you can point to saying, right, these guns now are the single longest lead items definitively and are going to stay that way for the age of the battleship is probably around the time you start to see the 40 and 45 caliber battleship grade guns coming in. So you're looking at around the late 1880s, early 1890s, effectively the start of the pre-Dreadnought era as to the point where guns become your single longest lead item. So Long John asks, The Invincible class were poorly protected because they were designed for fighting cruisers, but up against coastal battleships, how do you think they would have fared, or even against a very lightly armoured ship such as the Espana class dreadnoughts? So against almost, not all, but almost any of these ships, the Invincible class will still suffer from the single biggest weakness that it has when it faces off against any capital ship, which is that its armour isn't designed to resist capital ship guns. But, one, that doesn't apply necessarily across the board because there are a number of quote-unquote coastal defence battleships whose guns, either by dint of being older models or being quite small, actually Invincible's armour probably can protect it against at longer ranges. So, for example, some of the very earliest US battleships, um, the, pre, the very earliest pre-dreadnoughts, which were designed as coastal defence ships, their gun calibre is, is more than enough to, in theory, cause Invincible problems, but they're so old by the time the Invincibles come out that the overall penetration of the gun and the accurate range of those guns is significantly less than what Invincible can manage with its longer barrel 12-inch guns. So it can kind of pull the same kind of trick it did on Scharnhorst and Nisenau at the Battle of the Falkland Islands and just stay away and pelt them to death. Uh, there are other 
coastal defense battleships like some of the earlier German ones that are armed with a 9.4 inch gun. Again, if Invincible stays at a relatively decent range, it's probably got a half decent chance of resisting those shells, although it will be a slightly longer range than it fought the Shan horse with their 8.2 inch guns. And that kind of translates across to, and as I say, a number of other smaller coastal defense battleships. Once you hit the kind of 10, 11 inch range and upwards, though, Invincible is vulnerable again. Now, the big, uh, the big single advantage it's going to have is the speed. Against practically any coastal defense battleship, Invincible is going to be considerably faster, so it can dictate the range, and most of the coastal defense battleships don't have particularly spectacular armor to write home about themselves, in some cases even less than Invincible. So you're kind of in a battle of both sides at that point, assuming we've got a 12 in, uh, 10 inch or larger weapon. Both sides can penetrate each other's armor, and that's pretty bad um, at, at most ranges. But the Invincibles have the speed on their side to be able to dictate how the battle goes. So that would give them a marginal advantage in theory, but one decent shot by either side and the other guy is going to be in a lot of trouble. When it comes to the Espana class, it's, yeah, the Espana class have same kind of weapons, same kind of layout. Um, in many ways, they actually look like scaled down Invincibles, um, but again, much slower their armor in that particular case is slightly better than the Invincibles, but mm, 8 inches of armor. Uh, at medium range against 12-inch gunfire, I wouldn't put my hopes too highly on its ability to resist. So that kind of play out similar to the coastal defense battleship scenario. The Spaniards are a bit faster than a lot of coast defense battleships, but still, the Invincible is going to be able to dictate the range, um, and the Spaniards slightly better armor probably isn't going to help it too much, although of the various scenarios of coastal defense and small battleships, the Espana class probably have the better, best chance of all of them against the Invincible. But as I say, because of all of these ships being vulnerable to each other's weaponry um, at the larger scales of guns, I wouldn't put safe money on Invincible taking many of them 100% of the time because there's just too much random chance involved with the uh, heavy caliber weapons and thin armor plate. At that point it's going to come down basically to the crew and to a little bit of luck. So if you put Invincible herself, let's say you take Invincible from 3rd Battle Squadron at the time of Jutland, yeah I'd, I'd put loads of money on that because Invincible's gunners were brilliant. Um, indefatigable from the same battle? Not so much. The 25th Dragon asks, what is your opinion on the French quad turret dash forward armament design versus the standard four twin or three triple designs? Why did the French not copy this design onto their heavy cruisers and whatever happened to the heavy cruiser design contest? I'm eager to hear if my Richelieu style Algerie got a laugh out of you. Well, the Treaty Era design contest, um, the winners were announced a few dry docks ago. So if you look through the last couple of dry docks, it's uh, there under the channel admin. It's, I've specifically noted it there. Um, in terms of that particular design, yes, it was it was quite amusing, actually. Um, nice to see someone picking up on the uh, historical trends in French design, at least as far as capital ships were concerned. Um, but anyway, with regards to the quad turret dash forward armament design, I quite like it. Um, there, it, it did save on citadel space and therefore armor which is what it was designed to do and you can actually see that when they were redesigning various things so when they designed the uh, Gascogne with its forward and rear turret set up they had to lengthen the citadel slightly um, and obviously quite significantly with the Alsace as well. I'm generally in favor of uh, all forward turret armaments for battleships, albeit that, that I admit that is a fairly niche opinion. Um, there are things you could have done even further to um, to shorten up the citadel. So you can see it on this picture of Richelieu, for example, you could move the f uh, forward turret slightly further back um, so they're a bit more Nelson-style spacing, which would save you even more length, but eh, it's neither here nor there. 
Now, as for why they didn't copy this design onto their heavy cruisers, firstly, all the French heavy cruiser designs, except for the ones they didn't get to actually start because of the outbreak of World War II, all predate both the Dunkirk class and the Richelieu class. Secondly, the design compromises... Well, the compromises, because everything is a balance of uh, pluses and minuses, but the compromises you make to have an all-forward quad-gun uh, turret are largely beneficial for battleships. The downsides are more exaggerated for something like a cruiser, and the benefits are slightly less. So one of the biggest benefits with an all-forward arm is your, you can shorten your uh, citadel space quite considerably. However... With a cruiser, you've got to bear in mind the cruisers tend to be at least somewhat faster than battleships, which means they're going to have more machinery space per tonnage, which in turn means that your overall uh, citadel length is going to be dictated more by your machinery than your main battery, which um, so the, it means that your the shortened citadel that you get is probably going to be a somewhat less of a benefit you're going to not shorten it by quite as much as you would with a battleship even a fast one like Richelieu you've also got to take into account that a battleship generally speaking at least will either be expecting to fight in a line or if it's not fighting in a line if it's fighting in a small squadron or individually it's probably only going to have one or two targets and they're probably only going to be in one particular arc at which point the blind spot for the main battery on something like a Richelieu is less of an issue because you just point towards your target. Whereas with a cruiser, you can expect to have cruiser actions that involve a lot more ships, possibly engaging multiple targets. And at that point, therefore, you can't really afford to have a blind spot, especially when a lot of your targets might be fairly agile things like light cruisers or destroyers that could very well get into that rear arc and stay there if you're not very careful. The other thing is obviously a quad turret involves quite a lot of width and again cruisers designed for high speed they tend to have a fairly uh, high length to beam ratio so their hulls are going to overall be narrower and so you can fit a twin and, or maybe a triple turret in certain parts of their hulls and have a look at something like the Pensacolas to see what happens when you you, you qu can't quite actually do that when you'd really like to. Um, but if you're trying to fit a quad turret on a cruiser, it's going to have some serious space issues because of the narrowness of that hull. So for all of these reasons and a number of others, you're going to end up in a situation where it, it doesn't quite make sense for most heavy cruisers to have a, an all forward quad armament because, as we've just covered, there's going to be some fairly major downsides that aren't quite as disadvantageous on battleships and some of the upsides you get for a battleship either become downsides or they're not really as advantageous as they might otherwise be. Now that's not to say it's not possible, it certainly is, um, it's just that it's not quite as obvious a design choice and you would have to make a lot more allowances and design changes to accommodate it uh, as compared to doing it for a battleship. Dave Collier asks, the War of Jenkins' Ear, what was that all about? So, as with any major conflict, there's a huge list of reasons and factors that go into it, but the short version is that the British and the Spanish had never really quite gotten on when it came to the Caribbean and South America, all the way back to the era of uh, Sir Francis Drake. And... In this particular case, you had various commercial interests, including the South Sea Company, who weren't too happy with their position in the Caribbean versus Spain, and they wanted to improve this. Now, Spain kind of, in certain segments of the Caribbean, had a dominance. The British had dominance in some other areas militarily, but um, let's be fair, outside of the sugar trade, Spain was raking in a lot more money than the British were. And so the British sailors in the area were, shall we say, somewhat unorthodox in their manner of uh, trading, trying to get around various Spanish laws and uh, trading restrictions by effectively smuggling. This led to the Spanish forces cracking down quite hard 
on this kind of activity, and during one of these theoretical intercepts, um, albeit that it, there was a little bit of a question as to was the British captain actually smuggling and was the Spanish ship that intercepted him actually part of the Spanish military effort or was he kind of a privateer, but mm, either way, um, this Captain Jenkins ended up getting his ear cut off. That wasn't very nice. That wasn't exactly the way boarding actions for inspection should be conducted. But nevertheless, that incident actually went past, well, pretty much without wider incident until a few years later when these various interests, both mercantile and unfortunately slaving at the time, which uh, the South Sea Company was quite heavily into, they decided that they were fed, as they fed up of their position and they thought let's agitate for a war and so they went back over the last few years and found all the various examples of places where perhaps the Spanish had gone a little bit over the board and presented this as outrages against British subjects and the uh, fact that Captain Jenkins has lost his ear was a fairly easy one to point to. It wasn't actually called the War of Jenkins' Ear at the time. That came uh, during the Victorian period when they were trying to categorise everything. But effectively, by presenting the situation as Spain impinging on Britain's honour by attacking various British citizens with uh, sort of in a very over-the-top manner, they were able to provoke the government into war. And they thought, oh, a short, sharp war would be able to take over a bunch of Spanish interests in the Caribbean. This will all go very well and uh, we'll make a lot of money out of it. It turns out that trying to get a bunch, can trying to run a war that's effectively been set off by a bunch of commercial interests when those commercial interests don't actually really appreciate how to run an, a proper conflict doesn't work out too well. To be fair, the war started off relatively well. Um, a number of Spanish uh, ports and ships were attacked, burned and seized. But all the way back to the latter part of the career of Sir Francis Drake, the Spanish uh, were fairly familiar with the British coming around and trying to steal all their stuff in the Caribbean. And so they did have a fairly well-developed system of fortifications and defences, which, when they weren't surprised out of the blue by a sudden declaration of war, could prove to be quite effective and after that initial run of success the British then found themselves throwing more men and more ships at the Spanish and between Spanish defences and to be fair a lot of tropical disease they didn't really make all that much headway and it it was looking to be kind of like a stalemate and then Europe descended into one of its many many sort of almost entirely all continental wars this conflict got subsumed into that one and at the end of it it was kind of all written off as a bad idea and everyone went back to what they had had beforehand um, at least until the next massive pan-european war which didn't go quite as well for spain andrew didera asks besides the u.s civil war and the romance of the three kingdoms battle of the red cliffs have there been any fleet or squadron battles worth noting that were fought on rivers while rivers seem to have always been important during wars, fights on them seem to be quite rare. Whilst the US Civil War does have something of a monopoly on sheer number and, in some cases, scale of river battles, throughout history there have been various battles on rivers. The thing is, most ship battles on rivers tend to be either in river estuaries, when you talk about large formations, or they tend to be the ship versus some kind of land-based fortification and indeed many of the battles even on in the american civil war riverine warfare quite a lot of those battles were against fixed gun batteries and forts on the river's edge so yeah the, the thing with most rivers is they're usually not big enough to actually fit squadrons or fleets <coughs> in the same location you can get small ships well not small ship well possibly small ship but you can get small actions i maybe two or three ships aside max and even then they're not going to be the world's largest ships by a long shot there's quite a lot of battles on lakes because well lakes have the space so that both you and your opponent can be separate enough to have naval bases but also close enough to have proper fights so the the fights on the various lakes during the war of 1812 for example are a good a good version of that now in terms of Full on fleet squadron battles are worth noting. There were quite a number actually of riverine engagements in 
the east on the eastern front in world war ii between uh, the germans and the russians and some of those did involve small squadrons and the thing is because even though they're squadrons the individual ships themselves are quite small you don't tend to really hear about them as like this particular battle did this this and this because that particular battle might be one of several skirmishes that were fought along that river system that day or that week um, but some of them are actually quite interesting and over time there have been others i mean uh, drawing upon a bit of my own uh, personal uh, knowledge the um, the bolivians uh, my mother's side of the family decided that they were going to have a war with paraguay the Chaco War in the early 1930s, and of course both countries known for not having any actual coastline, thanks Peru um, and Chile, but anyway, they decided to have a war and over a theoretically resource-rich region that turned out to be not so resource-rich in the end after all, but never mind, um, and there, there was a potential for a small riverine battle going on there since uh, both sides had armed vessels on the the local river system but unfortunately it turned out to be a case of well as is normally the case with river Rhine battle ships engaging shore targets and in that particular case random aircraft coming in and attacking shipping but as far as i'm aware they never actually got into a full-on ship versus ship fight if you go back much further in history you will find a fair number of river Rhine fights there were Quite a few, what you would probably define as river rather than estuary engagements during the medieval period. Um, and when you go back to the ancient period, there's definitely quite a lot. Um, ancient Egypt, for example, they had riverine fights all the way up and down the Nile at various points, either fighting Nubian and Ethiopian invaders from the south, the Sea Peoples coming in from the north, or each other when they were having one of their intermittent civil wars. John McCarthy asks, some ships of the interwar period had triplex rangefinders. If I understand it correctly, these were three rangefinders which all pointed in the same direction. What were they used for, and why did they need three rangefinders looking at the same thing? So they were used, well, as with any other rangefinder. Here's a good example on an Italian battleship. So if you look just aft of the super firing forward turret and then go above the conning tower you'll notice there is what looks a little bit like a five inch 38 mount without a gun and it has three uh, items sticking out of the side that is in fact a side view of a triplex rangefinder it's a fun little thing now what they were used for and why they needed three was basically to try and help increase accuracy. Now, in the video that I did on range finding, plotting, and fire control, I mentioned that the Italians on the Latorios loved their duplex installations, which had one stereoscopic and one coincidence range finder. Triplex ones were kind of another step above that. So you could have a couple of stereoscopics and a coincidence, or two coincidences and a stereoscopic, or three of the same, if you fancy committing yourself to one technology or the other didn't really make too much odds the main point of the triplex rangefinder was to help increase accuracy by cancelling out errors and whereas with the duplex rangefinder it was more about redundancy if if one broke then you could use the other and triplex obviously yeah if one breaks you've got two others to use if two break you've got a third one to use although one does wonder how you managed to break two of your rangefinders but never mind um so there was a certain degree of redundancy involved, the same as with the duplex ones. And as I said, you could have different types of rangefinder if someone had adopted a camouflage scheme or some other countermeasure that was particularly good against one or the other. But the reason for the three, more than anything else, was to try and eliminate errors in manufacture. Because any device manufactured by humankind, especially in an era prior to computer aided manufacturer is going to have some form of slight error built into it and the triplex rangefinder worked on in some ways a similar principle to salvo firing uh, though you could have in theory a quadruplex rangefinder but that'd be silly and heavy but a triplex rangefinder meant that as compared to a duplex you could actually start to get more accurate range readings because if you've got a single rangefinder 
if there's a small manufacturing error that throws it out by say 200 yards you're going to be 200 yards out and obviously you can correct that by spotting the ball of shot etc but whatever if you have two the problem is if one of them is out you don't know which one until you open fire um because it's a 50 50 chance if you have three however if there's any error in one of them the other two will give broadly similar readings and one of them will be out so you've now got much better idea of how reliably accurate your data is and so this will help you get more accurate first time salvos and also help you dial in your salvos going forward because if you look through the three uh, range finders in your triplex installation you see right well one says the t range of target is 18,000 yards, the other one says 18,100 yards, and the other one says 17,200 yards. You can probably be fairly confident that the one saying 17,200 is probably short due to some kind of error or perhaps misuse or misreading. Um, and the answer is the range actually lies somewhere between 18,000 and 18,100. So maybe you split the difference and go 18,050 and hopefully your first shots will be fairly accurate, and that applies throughout the battle. Brian Smith asks, what impact would the USS Saratoga have had if it had had better luck and would have been available for the various 1942 and early 43 carrier battles, i.e. Coral Sea, Midway, and Santa Cruz? Well, assuming that she manages to avoid getting torpedoed repeatedly, the carrier battle I think she could have had the most impact at would have been Coral Sea, because Coral Sea was a tactical Japanese victory, albeit a strategic American one, um, i.e. basically the Americans lost more and more important ships, but the Japanese didn't manage to accomplish their strategic objectives. Now, if Saratoga had been there along with uh, Lexington and Yorktown, that might have pushed the balance over a bit, because obviously more strike aircraft available to attack the Japanese, and also more combat air patrol with a higher chance, therefore, of intercepting the Japanese strikes. So maybe you don't have as much damage to... Well, as much damage to Yorktown. Um, maybe you don't lose Lexington. So, yeah. It, that, 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 that's where Saratoga, I think, has the opportunity to have the most benefit i mean obviously there is a possibility she gets caught out pretty much the same way as lexington which is bad but it's a, it's a smaller possibility versus the the much greater strike and defense opportunities that having a third fleet carrier offers the u.s navy at coral sea um at midway well we know how midway went and um <laughs> But you can't really ask for that much of a better result than what you got historically for Midway. Given the way the various carriers were deployed there, I don't think there would be an awful lot that having Saratoga around specifically would do to save Yorktown. With the possible exception, again, of being a fire magnet and potentially you lose Saratoga instead of Yorktown. Now... Santa Cruz, weirdly enough, in terms of Santa Cruz, whilst having Saratoga there might have helped swing the balance to a tactical American victory, or at least a score draw, I actually think having Saratoga at Santa Cruz would be a negative for two, well, for three main reasons, actually. And they're actually related to Saratoga's presence giving the US Navy a better outcome. Now, the reasons for that are as follows. One, if Saratoga takes part, given that Enterprise didn't make it out undamaged and obviously Hornet was lost, it's poss quite possible that Saratoga also gets damaged in the process, if not knocked out. Now, obviously, we with more aircraft, more combat air patrol, again, there's more chance it does more damage to the Japanese, but if Saratoga is damaged, then once Enterprise needs to go back for repairs to its damage, that means the US Navy has no carriers available, which is a lot worse than the one which Saratoga historically was. But secondly, um, if, let's say, Saratoga manages to tip the balance with a good early strike and either Enterprise isn't damaged or maybe Hornet 
if it's is is damaged instead of lost, basically the, a, a better victory, then the U.S. Navy is probably going to continue operating in theater without doing what they did historically, which was ask the British to lend them a carrier or two, and that's how you got HMS Victorious, a.k.a. USS Robin. Now, there's a couple of big outcomes from that particular mission, which I have discussed previously, but briefly here. The British got a lot more experience with operating new heavy attack aircraft like the Avenger Torpedo Bomber, and in um, operating strike missions in an American style, which greatly helped the Royal Navy's fleet air arm in developing their airstrike doctrine as the war went forward. But also, again, as I've pointed out, the American officers who were on board the Victorious, aka Robin, were very had a very high praise for the British methods of fighter control and direction, and they wrote this back to the US Navy, who, as a whole, who then took that on board and adopted some of those practices and procedures into US doctrine going forward. Now, obviously, if that mission doesn't happen, then the British are going to take longer to get to sort of uptake and operate things like the Avenger, but also it means that US fighter control and direction tactics are going to take longer to develop and mature as compared to how they did historically. And that might actually end up costing the US Navy a lot more lives than might be theoretically saved by Saratoga making the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands a slightly better victory because that means probably for at least the next two or three big battles, American fighter control won't be quite as good, which means you're going to get more air Japanese aircraft getting through to attack American carriers. You're going to end up with potentially m more American fighters being shot down because they're not going to be vectored in in as large quantities, therefore not going to have as much superiority, um, locally speaking, in various engagements, and so on and so forth. And so both in terms of pilots and in terms of ships lost having Saratoga win Santa Cruz and therefore not needing the Robin mission might actually long-term damage the US Navy's prospects a lot more than, than just winning that single engagement. And it's one of those interesting butterflies that you see going forward. Because at, at the end of the day, it's not going to affect whether or not America wins the war, but it is going to affect how many people come back. Bryce Stotler asks, on the equipment of other services, you may see some form of livery painted, like a, a shark's face painted on the front of a P-51. Other than the large red dragon displayed on HMS Dragon, have any other naval ships enjoyed this kind of practice? Also, bonus or joke question, you must make your choice, coffee or tea? So in terms of displaying fancy painted things on ships, well, way, 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 way back, you did have practices like, um, say, for the Egyptians putting, say, the Eye of Horus on a vessel um, and other similar features. And then in something approximating the sort of Phoenician Greco-Roman period, you had the gradual development of carving some form of statuary onto your ship, uh, as well as painted markings, which then would later develop into, as you can see here, the figurehead. And the figurehead was kind of the equivalent of the, the livery painting for much of the naval period thereafter, right up until the latter part of the 19th century, really. Um, then as the kind of very heavily raked bows that allowed for figureheads went away with the advent of the latter period of the Age of Iron and then the Age of Steel, you start to see other forms of painting so you had obviously the peacetime color schemes generally um, more specifically certain navies would go with various bow ornaments which kind of replaced figureheads the u.s navy was one of the ones that went into this in a big way but as you got into the 20th century really anything of that kind was basically a fire hazard dash shrapnel hazard and so they kind of went away they're also just extra weight which every pound or kilo counted at that point um and obviously everyone went over to 
trying to use a form of optical camouflage with various shades of grey and then various camo schemes. So that kind of naval art died out and there wasn't really a chance to put new kinds of painting, uh, art, sort of decorative painting on ships for pretty much the same reasons you wanted to remain unseen. Nowadays, the visual spotting is probably, to be perfectly honest, less of an issue. And, well, given the ranges that these things, uh, the, the modern naval battles would be fought at, and the fact that most stuff is going to be decided by radar engagements, as I say, visual spotting is probably less of an issue nowadays, and naval grey is probably more rooted in tradition than anything else. So I think this is why you might start seeing naval artwork come back a little bit more. But um, yeah, for those reasons, specific kind of naval artwork as in painted onto the sides of the hulls has been fairly rare in more recent periods. And as for coffee or tea, that's actually quite a difficult one. <laughs> the weird thing is I don't drink too much of either a um, little bit of personal anecdote time, but back when I was at university, I worked very closely with a couple of guys and we did pretty much all our group projects together. And this was great, <laughs> except for the fact that, like me, they all start, they both started off pretty switched on during the mornings. And then they got both got into the habit of drinking tea. Neither of them was actually British, so this was kind of in some ways a bit of a new thing to them. And although well, this is fine, starts off as a nice little habit. By about the third year, I don't think either of them were functional until they'd had at least a couple of very, very strong cups of tea. And I kind of looked at that and went, mm, yeah, I'd rather not be dependent on a supply of hot drinks to keep myself up and alert in the morning. So, well, before and now, especially since then, I tend to avoid tea or coffee. And to be perfectly honest, I don't particularly like the taste of either, if I'm if I'm 100% honest. So... I will only use tea or coffee as kind of a, a version of a hot energy drink um, when I need to really wake up for whatever reason. And in aid of that, um, I'm one of these people who will grab a sugar dispenser and just start pouring it into their tea and or coffee um, until it stops dissolving. This is what I consider to be an adequate amount of sugar. And um, so whether or not I'm drinking tea or coffee or as uh, the uh, as Dave Rawlings, the guy who taught me historical European martial arts for a few years, once quoted weaponized caramel, um, I'll, I'll leave that for you to decide. <laughs> so if, if one or the other had to go, I wouldn't be particularly heartbroken either way. About the only thing I would probably say is that Tea is the one that I find easier to drink in a social setting once it's piled high with sugar, um, whereas coffee is kind of my, my go-to if I need an hour or two of ridiculous energy, and then I'll order the single biggest coffee that anybody can find, put a little bit of milk in it, and then, as I say, sugar till it stops dissolving, and then drink up. Uh, that's when you get a kind of a Futurama fry on 100 coffees moment. And now for about half a minute of quiet interlude music. David Thornthwaite asks, The Royal Navy's Mediterranean fleet seems to have had the second or more often third best heavy units, with the best being deployed to the home fleet and Force H. Given the strengths of the Kriegsmarine and the Regia Marina, do you think it, this was the best distribution of British battleships and aircraft carriers? Well, first of all, are you calling my HMS Wars by a second-rate ship? Because if so, you may have just made an enemy for life. But in all seriousness, it's a fair point to make. Now, there are a few reasons for it, and to be perfectly fair, Admiral Cunningham was screaming constantly for more and better ships, but particularly he wanted modernised Queen Elizabeths, uh, which he eventually got, and then the Italians took out of play for a while, but never mind. Um, 
the main reasons for the Mediterranean fleet seeming to get kind of the second and, and, and third rate cast offs for a lot of the time were twofold. One was that, well, the war started with Germany. So when you look at the Mediterranean fleet around about mid-1939, it's actually got a number of quite powerful units in it. Those units gradually get recalled back to the UK over late 39 and 1940 because, well, the Kriegsmarine is the threat. And also, hopefully, the French will be partly taking care of the Mediterranean. What you get is Italy joining the war and France dropping out of the war almost not quite, but almost simultaneously, which is kind of a one-two punch. And then you end up with this slight problem of you've relocated a lot of, if not all of your really nice ships to Scapa Flow and the surrounding areas. And the Germans at that point have the Scharnhorsts and they're, st they're beginning to get the Bismarcks online. Bear in mind, at this point, the Italians don't have the Littorios online. The Littorio and Vittorio Veneto only come online during the Italian involvement in the war. So initially, what the Royal Navy has to worry about is the modernised Italian dreadnoughts from World War One, And they're fairly confident that outside of speed, the mix of Bar and Malaya, the unmodernised QEs, the, and the various R-class can probably handle them. Um, when Littorio and Vittorio Veneto show up, obviously it's another matter, and this is when Cunningham really gets pressing for um, someone to allocate him some modernised QEs, but still. Um, the thing is, at any given time, the Germans have more modern, fast capital ships to threaten the British with, and more to the point, whilst the Italians obviously are a threat to the North Africa, there isn't that much shipping going through the Mediterranean, even though it normally would be. It's all having to be diverted because just by the fact the Italians are at war, it's not safe. Um, whereas the Atlantic, you can't not ship through it. So if you're faced with a threat of two, three, four fast battleships, i.e. the Shan Horse and possibly both Bismarcks, potentially breaking out into the Atlantic, that's going to do a lot more damage and be a lot greater threat to the Royal Navy than two fast battleships in the Mediterranean are going to be. And the Royal Navy only has so many fast battleships, and until Hood is lost, they only have one that can actually catch Bismarck, Turpit, Scharnhorst, Nisnow, or indeed Littorio, Vittorio, Veneto. The only other ships they have that can actually catch them are Renown and Repulse, and after December 1941, Renown. Even though the King George V's are fast battleships, they're not quite as fast, and Nelson and Rodney are very powerful, but they're not the world's quickest. So the Royal Navy's trying to keep as much as they can to guard the more important it's not, it's not to say the Mediterranean isn't important but the Battle of the Atlantic is the most important theatre at that point so as long as Scharnhorst, Neisenau, Bismarck, Tirpitz and various combinations thereof remain a threat the Royal Navy is going to stick with kind of the the format that it had in 1939-1940 where their their newest heaviest ships are in the in UK home waters and then anything else that they can spare gets sent to the Mediterranean because, well, the if the the thing is, the Mediterranean is a smaller theatre, and so the modernised QEs at least, and to, to a certain extent the older unmodernised ones and the R's, are still a, a they're still a threat to Littorio and Vittorio Veneto. The fifteen inch guns will hurt, and obviously, as I said, they're they're pretty confident they can take the older Italian battleships as well. Um, and so, in the Mediterranean, the Italians have to come to the Royal Navy to achieve most of the objectives. It's, they're either going to have to go after fixed points like Malta, which you can you can then get to, or they have to come to North Africa. But basically, this although tactically the speed is still a big issue, strategically being slower is less of a disadvantage in the Mediterranean for the Royal Navy than it is in the Atlantic. Um, when it comes to aircraft carriers, actually, the generally speaking, 
the Mediterranean fleet gets the modern carriers. Uh, Ark Royal stays until it's sunk at Force H. Um, Courageous obviously gets sunk early. Glorious also sunk pretty early. Furious stays um, outside of the Mediterranean or in the Western Mediterranean, coming in from the sort of Force H direction. Eagle um, operates for a while with the Mediterranean fleet and then transfers over to Force H, then gets sunk. But most of the actual carriers that are deployed to the Mediterranean fleet are the more modern armoured carriers, and it's just as well they were, because once Flieger Corps X gets going, they need to be. Federico Bozzi asks, I read somewhere that the machinery of Richelieu was much more efficient compared to its competitors. Is that so? So the the secret to Richelieu's machinery, and this is why you can't actually, in something like Spring Sharp, make Richelieu work, quote-unquote, on its design tonnage, is because they used a brand new and experimental boiler. It uh, made by a company called Sural. This was, well, to say it was a leap of faith, um, it, it puts Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade's leap of faith, to shame, to be perfectly honest, because the thing was basically purely experimental. They went with it despite it not actually having been proven yet. Luckily, it worked. <laughs> if it didn't, they would have had a lot of problems. But anyway... The new boiler was an extremely compact, extremely high-pressure system compared to standard boilers of the time, and this allowed the boiler to produce a lot more steam from a lot smaller volume, and as a result, it meant that whereas a lot of battleships, especially battleships that had to get up to the kind of speed that Richelieu did, needed three boiler rooms, Richelieu could make do with only two which meant its machinery space was massively less than would be otherwise on a ship of its size and speed, and thus they could afford to fit various other bits and pieces onto the ship using up that space and displacement that they otherwise would have occupied with machinery. And to give you some idea of just how critically important saving that amount of machinery space actually is, um, whilst it is inevitable that you will end up comparing it to Bismarck. Let's go there. Richelieu is faster. It has the same number of guns at the same calibre. It has thicker belt armour. Oh, fair enough, only just, but still. It has considerably thicker deck armour. So, on that triangle of speed protection and firepower, Richelieu is better protected. It's got the same level of armament and it's faster and okay fair enough some of that is down to efficiency of layout it's got the shorter citadel it can save weight there um, it's got better design overall because in terms of efficiency because the french battleship designers hadn't been quite as uh, short changed as the german ones in the 20s and early 30s but also, that, that machinery space saved plays a massive, massive part in it all. Matt Blom asks, In Drydock 96, you mentioned the Scharnhorst class battleships designers drew from Germany's World War I battlecruisers. Can you elaborate on certain design choices and influences that these designers took from the battlecruisers, and were any specific influences taken from the Mackensen class? So when it comes to the Scharnhorst class, well, any German post-World War I design, the, depending on the source you look at, you'll get a different degree of, oh, well, this was clearly influenced by this or that other class from the World War I period. Um, you'll find some... Some books, like with the, like I said in the in Dryden ninety six, you'll find some books that say, "Oh yeah, so the Bismarck is just a warmed over Bayern." No, it's it's really not. <laughs> now with the Scharnhorsts, there is a certain amount of influence you can detect from the Mackensons and Erzatz uh, Yorks, which, to be honest, are really just slightly altered Mackensons. Now, obviously, the triple turrets are not uh, a holdover, nor is the eleven inch armament. Um, but in you, when you look at the the whole form, the propulsion layout, etc. There are some similarities there. 
and more particularly with the armor layout now obviously the shan horse have a much thicker main belt than was planned for the mackinsons or the ersatz yorks but when you look at the distribution of that armor in terms of the length and of the length of the main belt and also the where you have the because it's a distributed armor scheme where you have all the various thinner patches of armor the correlation between the mackinson and the shan horse armor belts in that respect is actually relatively good the only ma major difference outside of thickness is really deeper in the hull of the ship when you're looking at the torpedo defense art, um, section and obviously you'd expect that to change because torpedoes become much more of a threat and torpedo defense technology had also evolved quite considerably um so yeah but it, it's it's when the Shan Horse are, when you say the Shan Horse are influenced by German battle crews and to a certain extent battleship design, it's in terms of what I would call themes rather than specifics. So the theme of the distributed armor scheme, theme of how that armor is distributed, the, the exact layout of it, but not the thickness, which is a specific. That's probably the main contribution. And as I say, we're, when you look at the displacement as well, the Mackinsons and the Shan Horse and the Azatz Yorks are all in roughly the same ballpark displacement-wise, albeit the Shan Horse are obviously faster with more modern machinery and such like. So it's natural that there would be a certain amount of, of sort of ancestral influence there. Um, it's the Shan Horse in a lot of ways, like say with the armament, the secondary battery, etc. In those ways, they are those elements are clean sheet design um, but there are definite influences of world war one doctrine when it comes to to the armor layout and this is one of the things that sean horse has a turtle back in a similar manner to the bismarcks and with the best will in the world this wasn't some new radical innovative solution that had been come up with just for german battleships post world war one this was basically, with a few minor alterations, exactly the same armor scheme <laughs> that the German ships of World War One had used. And indeed, so did most capital ships of World War One and pre-dreadnoughts. Um, if you look at the, uh, if you took a cross section of dreadnought, the Lord Nelson class, Der Flinger. Um, Nassau and the yeah and half a dozen other battle cruisers, pre dreadnoughts and dreadnoughts that all saw service in World War One. If you file away the thicknesses and you put it up against the armor layout of the Shan Horsts or the Bismarcks, they're all going to look much of a muchness. There's nothing really special about it other than it's an old armor layout and. Well, let's leave it there. Christopher Brandt asks, The legacy of the Dreadnought is self-explanatory. However, it does not appear to be in line with the actual history of HMS Dreadnought, the ship. Why did HMS Dreadnought not have such a spectacular career compared to the legacy of the Dreadnought concept as a whole? Basically, it's a combination of timing for World War I and the sheer speed of both construction in British shipyards and technological development. So, obviously, Dreadnought coming into service 1906. Ten years later, you have the Battle of Jutland. Now, in the Age of Sail, a major battle with a capital ship that's ten years old, you'd probably actually consider that ship to be one of your newer ones. Um, and, to be honest, even in the Ironclad era... 10 years i mean warrior is quite quickly outpaced by technological advancement 1870 hms devastation that kind of thing so warrior certainly wouldn't be the the front of the rank in an 1870 battle but with the pace of technological development being quite quick then but also ships being built in much smaller numbers warrior would still find a place in the battle line and there would still be a fair number of ships that she could take on um world war ii obviously in okay fair enough in part due to the treaty system but there are ships that are 10 20 30 years old taking quite an active part in world war ii 
and so on and so forth. So why is at Jutland is Dreadnought not there? Well, I say it's this very unique combination of massive technological advancement combined with the um, speed of British shipbuilding. Because, well, 10 years down the line, you've gone from HMS Dreadnought to HMS Queen Elizabeth, which is, well, and actually the Revenge class as well, which is quite the jump. And to be honest, even then, that's more of a seven to eight year technological leap because there weren't follow on battleships being built during World War One. So if you think about Queen Elizabeth's kind of 1913 ships, the Revengers 1914 ships. So by 1916, 1516, you'd be at least one, maybe two battleship generations further down the line at the time of Jutland. But uh, that's a little bit of a side note. But the simple fact is that with when you're talking about your frontline capital ships being these 15-inch gun monsters, then all of a sudden a ship that's got 12-inch guns is very much a, a second-line combatant. And you see this at Jutland. The vast majority of the British battle lines 13.5-inch or more. The 12-inch ships are very much in the minority. And, you, yeah, okay, fair enough. The Bellerophon class are very slightly modified dreadnought layouts, and they are present... But the, I mean, the Germans at this point, they're bringing the Nassaus, which are their version of Dreadnought, and they're bring, they're actually bringing the, the Deutschland class pre-Dreadnoughts, whereas Dreadnought herself, just as a, because of the sheer size of a number of ships that the Royal Navy possesses at that point, they've actually released Dreadnought for other duties, um, supporting the King Edward VII in defence of the UK elsewhere. And so Dreadnought actually misses Jutland because of this this deployment elsewhere. So the British are starting to release their earliest Dreadnoughts at a time when the Germans are still actually bringing their pre-Dreadnoughts with them. Um, although it must be mentioned at this point, both sides did actually have extensive pre-Dreadnought squadrons in their fleets at the start of World War II. And this is what I mean by timing. That's World War One. Pre-Dreadnoughts in World War Two is just silly, unless you're the Germans. Um, but yeah, so like in, in 1914, Dreadnought would have seen a sort of a front row seat at any theoretical um prototype battle of jutland but it's just just that timing of of jutland in 1916 she misses out on that and that's really the only chance the grand fleet gets to shine during world war one um, she does get to ram a submarine which is is an is a notable thing anyway um but yes it, it it's it's this the, the case of timing there's British have far too many ships by 1916 so they can afford to release her and the Grand Fleet only getting this this one chance to really get stuck in if it hadn't if it if that battle had taken place in 1914 or 1915 then Dreadnought would have got was present at Battle of Jutland to her name most certainly um and but that didn't happen and so unfortunately she just kind of went from all conquering brand new battleship to relegated to second line duties in less than a decade and then to the scrap heap in about five or six years after that. Cicero asks, prior to the start of the Imjin War, Toyotomi Hideyoshi attempted to hire Portuguese vessels as escorts to guard his invasion fleet. Excluding the idea that the turtle ship was an ironclad warship 250 years too early, how do you think a Portuguese galleon, similar to the type that visited Japan, would have fared on a one-on-one -on -one basis versus a turtle ship? So this is actually a really interesting one. I think it's going to come down to what environment the ships engage in. Because the turtle ships have... I mean, they can't be boarded, and bear in mind at this point, Portuguese galleons... Um, well, actually, well, given this is kind of the Armada type era, they're eventually going to come under Spanish control, a lot of them, but nevertheless, similar. They're similar in design. Um, but And actually, there were a number of Portuguese, ex Portuguese galleons in the Armada, but never mind. Um, the Turtle Ship's guns are a little bit more uniform than the galleons. There's actually, believe it or not, if you're talking about a large galleon of the kind that's going to go transoceanic, the turtle ship probably has slightly fewer guns. The tur but I say they're more uniform, but the turtle ship's guns are slightly smaller than the largest guns that you're going to find on a galleon, and also a galleon's 
cannons are going to be shooting solid shot and grape shot and the occasional dart, whereas by all estimations the turtle ship's guns seem to be more suited towards firing big darts and grape shot. They can shoot solid shot, but it doesn't seem to have been quite as common as it would be in the West. The galleon is probably faster, at least as long as the wind is in its favour. The turtle ship is much more agile, and as I said, the galleon is still probably looking to board, which is going to be an absolute pain against something like a turtle ship, so uh, there's that. I would then reckon that you're probably looking at something along the lines of... If you end up with a galleon versus turtle ship fight and Admiral Yi is in command and he's forced the galleons to engage him in a narrow, fairly narrow channel, I suspect I would give the advantage to the turtle ships because their gunners are going to be more expecting to load, aim, fire, load, aim, fire, load, aim, fire. So they'll probably start ripping into the lower hull of the galleon whilst the galleon will put out a pretty devastating broadside assuming that it can get bearing on the turtle ship, because I say the turtle ship's probably more agile, but assuming they close to boarding range, the galleon's going to expect one or two broadsides and then go to boarding and then discover that actually boarding is very difficult. Um, now, in this kind of scenario, they do still have, the galleon does still have a couple of advantages. One, it's got more guns and more and, he and heavier guns, so its gunfire is going to do considerably more damage to the turtle ships than, say, Japanese limited return fire did historically. But also the second bit, which is actually quite important, is that the galleon's going to be a lot taller, which means whilst, again, that doesn't really help very much with the boarding part, as we've discussed in previous uh, questions when we've talked about galleons themselves, there are quite a number of guns in the upper works of a typical galleon. Now, fair enough, they might be smaller guns than the, the sort of the hull-mounted heavy guns, but if you've got a, a hand, not hand-portable, but hand-aimed cannon or even some of the lighter sort of minion-style cannons, and you can aim those down from on high into the turtle ship that's actually going to probably do a fair bit of damage. So it's going to be kind of a race between can the the hull guns of the turtle ship rip apart the, the lower decks of the galleon faster than the upper guns of the galleon can rip apart um, and shoot through the the top of the, the turtle ship because the heavy guns in the galleon are probably going to get off a couple of salvos before they're going to A, have problems just being unfamiliar with rapid reload in battle and to the turtle ship's guns firing at them so it, it could go either way but with the agility bonus i'd be tempted to put my money slightly on the on the turtle ship in confined quarters um in the open ocean it's going to come down to the galleon's crew again if the galleon decides i'm going to lob a few broadsides and go into board it's it's pretty much confined itself to a similar situation as the coastal waters if you've got a slightly smarter galleon captain who maybe looks and realizes that boarding something covered in iron spikes is not such a wise idea and he decides he's just going to shoot at it with his guns until it gives in if the wind is on his side there's probably not a tremendous amount that the korean turtle ship can do against it uh, it might be a very long and drawn out battle given accuracy and reload times but in the open ocean, the galleon's probably got the technical advantage, assuming it goes for a gunfight. Moongara asks, was any thought given to using the secondary battery to get the range of an enemy ship and then using some form of conversion chart or other method, take the range information and use it to aim the main guns? It would seem like a good idea given the relatively high rate of fire of a secondary battery as compared to a main battery. So there was some thought given to this idea but it ran into technological development problems, basically. Um, so in the latter part of the pre-Dreadnought era, and actually, to be honest, in a lot of the pre-Dreadnought era, the rate of fire of main battery guns was so slow and the range is so close that you pretty much would be establishing the range with a secondary battery. The problem was once you got into the latter pre-Dreadnought era, like, say, the 1900s period, where ranges start to increase and increase and increase because you're able now with 
uh, better fire control and range finding to actually hit with the UN guns at long distance, the battle range moves beyond the capability of the secondary guns to A, reach um, in some cases, B, reach accurately because it takes a lot longer for director firing and range finding to find their way onto the secondary batteries as opposed to the main batteries and also at the much more distant range if you're firing say a six inch gun or a five inch gun the splashes are going to be considerably smaller so they're going to be much harder to spot as opposed to the splash that's sent up by a 14 15 16 inch um heavy shell so there's kind of a very narrow window. You'd probably be looking at maybe a probably a five to ten year window where the secondary batteries are accurate enough and have just enough uh, ranging equipment to tell the pri the primary battery what the range is. As you said, because yeah, if you can fire once every few seconds, you can go okay. Well, we think the range is let's say at that point maybe. 1500 yards right let's fire a salvo at 1500 and then five seconds later we'll fire one at 1800 and then five seconds after that we'll fire one at 1200 and at this point they'll still be loading the main battery you see where those falls of shot are for in the next 10-15 sort of seconds you're like okay right so it's between say salvo what two and salvo three so we'll correct and we'll go for 1300 yards and 1400 yards Okay, we've got straddles on both, so the range is probably about 1350 yards. We'll tell the main battery, range 1350 yards, just about the time main battery engages. It does make a lot of sense for that period. Um, but say, unfortunately, once you get into World War One, and you're talking about sort of Battle of Jutland ranges, anything from 12 to 18,000 yards typically, and then World War Two. A lot of engagements ranging out even further than that it it's too far for the secondaries basically um and they don't have large enough range finding equipment to be accurate at those ranges anyway unfortunately sam samuelson asks marines on uss texas in new york during world war ii where did they physically stay on the ship? How much did they interact with the rest of the crew? I did they have separate dining bunk facilities, recreation facilities, and what training did they do with small arms? So I'll say straight up at this point, this is not a particular area of naval history that I'm entirely familiar with. So I will give a, a broad overview from what I've been able to discover. And if anyone either maybe was in a marine detachment or was on a ship that had a marine detachment because they did get rid of them only relatively recently um or maybe know someone who served in a marine detachment or something or is maybe even a historian about that particular field and is watching the channel um and i know there are a few retired and active u.s navy personnel who do watch if you can provide more details in the comments please feel free to do so um but for, as I say, from what I've been able to discover on a ship like in Texas or New York, the Marine Detachment, they would have training with their small arms. The, the Marine Detachments on World War II U, US ships did actually see a reasonable amount of action, not just in things like boarding and inspection, but actually in landings and such like um, where they were particularly useful. And really odd ones as well, like taking pot shots at mines. So their small arm tactics definitely had to be kept in check uh, and in in uh, sort of high high regard because there's a very good chance they're going to be using them um i think as far as i can tell they were generally sort of billeted in one particular space but there wasn't like a this is the marines mess this is the marines recreation facility this is uh the, the sort of this is the exclusive marine area of the ship because let's face it on a warship you don't really have the space for that kind of thing um you're trying i think as far as i can tell say they'd keep the marines together in one general space but that's just because it made things organizationally a little bit easier um in terms of interacting with the rest of the crew m when they're not landing at various places and uh taking pot shots at weird floating explosives the marines that i've found tend to be found manning anti-aircraft weapons um in the secondary battery so the five inch guns 20 mils 40 mils uh, and let's face it they're all they're all taught how to shoot before they come on the ship 
Um, and some of them will have been taught how to shoot artillery. So giving them some slightly bigger guns to take pot shots at enemy a- aircraft, especially when you're in an environment like World War II, where the US Navy's adding as many light and medium anti-aircraft weapons as it can on board a ship. There's weight issues with doing that. There's stability issues with doing that. And that's just compounded by having to bring in extra crews for them. So having an already existing marine detachment that can take over the running of several of those installations is an excellent idea. Um, so that that would be a lot of what they'd be doing. And as a result, they'd have pretty decent normal interactions with the rest of the crew. Because, um, yeah, they might be manning half a dozen Bofors installations, but they'll be right next to regular service personnel from the Navy who'll be manning the other 40mm installations, and they'll all be firing in support of the poor guys who get stuck with the 20mm Orlicans and the luckier ones are in the 5-inch 38 mount. So it's all much of a muchness. I think, to be perfectly honest, the kind of institutional separation that you sometimes see from various departments... Um, that's largely probably a product of peacetime in wartime when someone external to you is trying to kill you. The fact that one of you's from the US Marine Corps, the other's strictly US Navy, probably doesn't make all that much difference by and large when something, when somebody wearing the emblem of the rising sun is come screaming out of the sky with a 500 pound bomb strapped to their aircraft. William H. Burke III asks... In brief, if possible, what German submarine technologies were acquired by the Allies versus the Soviets at the end of the war? Did one or the other get more and or better technology? In very general terms, most of the German submarine technology was accessed by both the Allies and the Soviets. Um, largely on the basis that pretty much almost every advance the Germans had made in submarine technology could be encapsulated in the Type 21 U-boat. And um, the of the Type 21s that were captured, the UK got one, the US got some, and Russia got, or the Soviet Union at the time, got some. So everyone had a Type 21 to look, or more to look at and examine all the tech for. However, with that said... The USSR, the Soviet Union, probably actually got the better end of that particular deal because whilst the British and the Americans got a few to play with, the Russians actually ended up getting quite a few more than they were ostensibly allowed by the various post-war treaties because various factories that made the components for Type 21 U-boats and various shipyards with incomplete Type 21s also ended up in the Soviet part of Germany. And so they were able to then build and complete and analyse a lot more Type 21s and their technology in a lot more detail than, say, the Americans or the British, who only had a limited number of boats and could obviously only... You can only dismantle a piece of technology so many times... Uh, before it stops working. So, yeah, the, the the Russians, broadly speaking, probably got the better end of the deal when it came to analysing the Type 21 and various associated sub- German sub-technologies, again, because they had most of the facilities and the factories as well. But on the other hand, you could potentially look at it the other way around, as in, by having access to a very limited number of the sub-technologies, it meant that the US and the UK had to take what they'd had and then an expand, develop, and innovate beyond it, because they simply weren't in a position to just build a bunch of Type 20 once the Soviet Union was. And it could be argued that then that allowed them to evolve derivative technologies first, which would be kind of maybe like a uh, a safer, but more of a halfway stepping stage between that and going full bore with their own subtech. But again, this is getting into early Cold War stuff, which is not necessarily my my particular field of expertise. So if there is anybody out there with uh, expertise in the development of early Cold War era submarines, (laughs) please feel free to chime in. Sleeping Ninja asks, you often talk about inaccurate gunfire of certain capital ships due to things like shell quality, lack of radar control, etc, etc. But what would you say are a few of the most effective and accurate guns dash gun platforms if every gun had equal fire control systems, shells, etc, etc? 
finally, could any of these misgivings that some of the better guns had have changed the results of any battles or theatres in which they operated in if they were fixed? So, oddly enough, actually, two of the best guns across both world wars were developed around about the same time. That's the British 15-inch 42 and the American 14-inch, which saw various marks and mods, um, but basically the 14-inch that you see on most of the standard battleships like the New Mexico's, Tennessee's, Pennsylvania's, etc. They were both capable of hitting very hard, and once their problems were fixed, well, more especially the problems with the 14-inch mountings, etc., were fixed, they were also both very accurate. The 15-inch 42 is a really, really weird one, to be perfectly honest. It's, by any metric, it should have failed abysmally. It was rushed into service, it was very quickly developed com from the 13.5-inch uh, compared to the development process that led to practically any other naval gun, except for maybe the 16-inch 50. Um, and, yeah, so by any measure, it's a rush job, it should never have worked, and it somehow by ev literally everybody's metrics, whether you're American, Italian, French, German, British, whoever, when you actually look at the, its performance, it was from the start and remained one of the most accurate guns pretty much ever in terms of naval artillery. Um, as long as you had a fire con control system that could shoot it straight. But even if you didn't have a particularly good fire control system, its spread was still very good. Uh, i.e. I, very tight, and it was very reliable. The American 14-inch gun, as I say again, very powerful, especially for its size. Um, it just had a few more maturity issues, m which were less to do with the gun. There are a few issues with a few minor bits of the gun, but more to do with the mountings and the fact that they packed them in a bit too close to each other in uh, quite a number of the triple turrets. Outside of that, the Russian 12-inch 52 caliber gun that was found on their various World War I dreadnoughts was a very good weapon, and surprisingly good, because 12-inch 50 and over weapons of the World War I era period generally didn't work that well. Um, they either worked very badly or underperformed compared to what you'd expect. The 12-inch 52 was long-range, accurate, good penetration, it was just all around a really, really good weapon. It just suffered from, well, two problems. One, it was stuck on the Imperial Russian dreadnoughts, which kind of meant they didn't get, it didn't get to accomplish all that much in the service period when it was relevant. But also, two, because it was made in Imperial Russia, it meant it went into service aboard the Gangots and the various um, Black Sea equivalents at a time when everybody else had moved on to heavier guns. So you had this really, really, really nice 12-inch gun at a time when everyone else was looking at 13.5-inch, 14-inch, 15-inch guns, which was a little bit unlucky for them. All other things being equal, um, the German 15-inch gun... Well, actually, the European 15-inch guns of the Second World War weren't too bad. I mean, they all had their flaws, but these flaws are corrected under the, this paradigm. I mean, the French... The French had issues with the shells, um, mainly the shells blowing the guns off. Um, <laughs> the Germans had issues with their shells tending to not explode. They had very high dud rates across the board. Um, and they had some issues with their fire control systems not really <laughs> well. As we've said in the fire control video, German fire control systems partially tend to be a little bit more vulnerable than others and partially tend to wear their operators out faster, but um, that's neither here nor there in this case. And the Italian guns on the Littorios were very good and their shell control and charge control, uh, quality control efforts were abysmal. So taking those factors out, all of those 15-inch guns are modern 15-inch weapons, which are actually all very, very nice. Of the three, I'd actually probably go for the Italian one because it fires its shells at ludicrous speed. So it has ridiculous range, um, ridiculous penetration, assuming it actually hits anything. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I, that that's definitely up there. So yeah, I think that covers... Well, that covers basically all the major naval powers 
um, at least in mention, with the exception of the Japanese. And um, I mean, to be honest, the Japanese didn't have a run of bad guns, but off the top of my head, outside of the sheer power of the 18.1 inch, they didn't have anything that particularly stands out to me off the top of my head. So, um, I mean, the, the only thing with the Japanese would be maybe if you're equalizing fire control across the board and you're maybe equalizing it to a standard of Royal Navy or US Navy 1944 standard, that would dramatically increase the worrying power of the 18.1 inch gun because they'd actually be able to see things and hit things with the, with them. Um, the Japanese had excellent optical fire control, but optical fire control can it was a known quantity and could be defeated by things like uh, say USS Johnston hiding in hiding in some smoke and haze so yeah i mean the 18.1 inch gun if it reaches out and touches you you are in for a world of hurt um it just had problems with the touching you part um but if we're following a sleeping ninja's last part of the question if these issues were all resolved and everything was evened out and it was just down to the gun itself. Could they have changed the results of any battles or theatres they operated in? Well, going through that list, the 15-inch 42 was pretty successful. Um, the only the only battle where I would probably point to something and say if we're evening everything out where it could have made a major difference would probably be at the Battle of Denmark Strait, because if Hood's fire control system is taken up, if we, let's say, we're arbitrarily taking Allied World War war two 1944 standard as our, our baseline if hood's fire control system had been up to that standard and it had started landing telling hits on bismarck given that bismarck had a slight hesitation in opening fire itself that could very well have changed the outcome of the battle of denmark Strait pretty darn quickly um the U.S. didn't really i mean the only time the U.S. 14 inch gun really came into full-on use was at the Battle of Surigao Strait and well they won that very convincingly you don't need to really change anything there to make the Japanese ships any more dead um Bismarck's guns well they were they were performing within pretty decent parameters and right up until Rodney blew apart the fire control system so that's not something you can fix easily <laughs> say so that the Japanese when Yamato actually did engage with the safety on one inch guns, there with the US 1944 fire control that could have made a major difference at Leyte Gulf. I think the single biggest thing though would have been if you're evening everything out would be the Italian guns on the Latorios. Given how many straddles at ridiculous ranges that the Italians managed to get, if somebody had smacked their ordnance producing sections over their head with a very very heavy possibly lead line two by four and got them to do some decent quality control there's probably off the just instantly three or four fairly major important battles where sh british ships came away with splinter damage or splash damage but nothing particularly major where if those guns had been operating accurately with decent shells there'd probably be a fairly long list of badly damaged or destroyed royal navy warships and that could have turned the tide in the Mediterranean, especially if that then emboldens the Italians to take that same long distance, highly destructive gunfire up against battleships. Ben asks, What happened in turret 2 on board the USSR in the 1980s? I understand too much powder was loaded into the gun, but how did that lead to the turret itself essentially exploding and killing everyone inside? Was it the pressure wave alone, or were there other factors? Lastly, was something like this known to happen on all other ships at all on other ships prior to this or was it an isolated incident so it wasn't too much powder it was that the ram that pushes the powder in was basically went in too quickly and too far and compressed everything that caused friction friction caused smoldering smoldering led to flash and flash led to explosion um Basically, how that led to the turret blowing up and k killing everyone inside is very simple. Um, there were several hundred pounds of propellant charge going off in a very confined space, and the easiest route for that explosion to follow was out the open breach and into the turret. At that point, you have 
what, something like three and a half, four thousand psi of pressure as forming a shock wave, and temperatures are getting up to a couple of thousand, probably more degrees as a result of the fireball. Um, at that point, well, the pressure wave is going to buckle the bulkheads internally, so the gun crews and number one and number three guns aren't protected, and yeah, basically at that point you're you're in a a gigantic armored box with a near supersonic shock wave and temperatures that rival a a cool day on the sun bouncing around inside. At that point, anyone inside is dead. The human body is not made to really cope with that kind of situation. The pressure wave alone probably would have pulped everybody, and it's the thing that broke open the bulkheads. The fireball kind of just made sure that it was quick, assuming that anyone somehow magically survived the pressure wave. But nevertheless, um, was it an isolated incident, or had it happened in other ships? This kind of thing, unfortunately, has happened on other ships before. Um, it happened a couple of times, or it just was several times on various French ships in the Second World War, French capital ships, because of, not because of the specific incident that caused Iowa's turret to explode, but because of faulty design of shit the shell, which basically made it jam when you fired it sometimes, and then when it jammed in the barrel, then, well, again, the blast would blow up the back end of the gun. And turret explosions happened for various reasons in various navies other than that. I mean, um, HMS Thunderer, back in the 19th century, one of its main guns detonated, in that case because it had been accidentally double-loaded. Um, that was one of the things that brought the rifled muzzle loader to an end in Royal Navy service. Yeah, there, there, there's a long and unfortunate string of incidents when it comes to turret explosions, and annoyingly, outside of a sort of an odd run of them, like you have sometimes with the Richelieu class, where a problem hasn't been identified, almost none of them have exactly the same cause. The simple fact of the matter is, when you're dealing with naval artillery, there's an awful lot of explosive involved, and if any one of the many steps that you need to take to get that shell safely fired goes wrong, and it may not be your fault at all. And the, the French turret crew had no idea that their shells were uh, manufactured in error with with um, chambers for gas canisters that obviously weren't fitted, and that caused a structural weakness. Um, but yeah, usually, usually it wasn't down to crew error. It was usually down to something they had no control over, and occasionally when it was down to crew error, well, uh, t to be perfectly honest, the effect is pretty much the same. Soft Llama asks, I just read through Warrior to Dreadnought. Thanks for your recommendation. Oh, you're very welcome. It's an excellent book. And I was wondering, when sources report varied weight of shot travelling at so many thousands of feet per second, how did they measure this velocity in the 1800s? Well, there were a couple of ways in the 19th century, believe it or not. The ballistic pendulum is one of the oldest ones. Uh, that was actually invented in the 18th century, believe it or not. And to a certain extent, it's still in use today. This is basically a heavy weight at the bottom of a pendulum, and then you fire your projectile into the heavy weight. The heavy weight then moves a known distance along the track as it swings upwards, and then you can calculate the energy in the bullet because, well, kinetic energy equals half mv squared. There's also your momentum equations, and because you can then work out the velocity and the distance of the pendulum, which is obviously moving much slower than the bullet because it's a lot heavier, you can then calculate back, if you know the mass of the projectile that you just fired, how fast it was going. It's actually relatively simple in terms of uh, physics equations. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, the, the Royal Navy in this particular case did build a gigantic nine-ton ballistic pendulum, <laughs> um, which they then fired large naval artillery at in order to measure the velocity of the projectiles. The only slight downside was this of this was that even at nine tons, the thing got broken on regular occasions and had to be reset and rebalanced after every shot anyway. Um, so it, it was 
eminently workable. It just required a fair bit of downtime between <laughs> between measurements. And uh, it's not the kind of thing you build more than one of at any given time. However, in the 1860s, which is the time that Warrior to Dreadnought picks up on, there was an additional system that didn't require you to have a massive nine-ton contraption and hope that your accuracy was all right. And this was... Um, by a chap, I believe it's called Naves or Nuvez, something like that. Um, anyway, it wasn't wasn't British, as the name might suggest, but he'd invented a system whereby you would have a pendulum set up, actually already up at ninety degrees, and it would um, you would fire your gun not at the pendulum, but what you would fire your gun, and there would be a couple of trip wires that the projectile would cut, and when the first wire was cut then a magnet would release the pendulum and when the second wire was cut the magnet would catch the string that was on the pendulum so the pendulum would only fall a certain distance and because it was a pendulum with a known mass with a known arm with a known distance you could obviously work out exactly how long it by prior observation it took for this pendulum to fall a given amount um, and that gave you a time and then obviously you would measure the distance, pre-measure the distance between the two wires. So that gave you distance. And as we know, speed equals distance over time. So you could work out the speed from that. So yeah, surprisingly accurate. Uh, it took them a while to get that system up and running. <laughs> they actually, they saw it tested. They ordered a version. It came they forgot to ask for instructions in English, so they had this sort of complicated electromechanical device and no idea how to put it together. It took them a couple of weeks to figure it out and then actually pay for somebody to go and get some instructions, translate them into English and get it all working. But once it was all set up, they were all very happy with it. And uh, they actually improved it, managed to make it work over longer, longer distances as well. Although, given that you had to work with physical wire connections gun accuracy was still relatively important gabriel a hawkins asks it's always appeared to me that england's victory over the armada has been the red-headed stepchild of celebrated english victories trafalgar waterloo battle of britain el alamein and agincourt appear to be more celebrated than the defeat of the armada yet at least from my view the defeat of the armada was far more spectacular a victory and indeed it would have been far more of an upset if britain had lost to the armada as compared to trafalgar waterloo or el alamein so i've always wondered why there was not a monument to the defeat of the armada looking down at nelson in trafalgar square any thoughts so in terms of commemorative monuments and such, that to a large degree is basically just reflective of how the nation commemorated things at the time. There is actually an Armada memorial or monument, it's down in Plymouth, but that was built in the middle of the 19th century, um, in the Victorian period when everyone was into statue building. And this is pretty much it. When Trafalgar occurs the cultural sort of way of celebrating massive achievements at that point is the building of statuary or other monuments and so you get Nelson's column it's the same reason why you get the Arc de Triomphe in France at around the same period now when you go further back to the period of the Armada at least in Western Europe, by and large, building monuments in the form of statuary is not so much of a a done thing. Um, it's not very common. What you that you do have commemorations in the manner appropriate to the time. So what's showing on the screen at the moment is the Armada Medal or Armada Medallion, um, which was cast. Med commemorative medallions were very much a thing that was done. Um, and there's also a relatively famous big painting of Elizabeth I that was done in commemoration of it. And paintings and medals and formal jewellery and bits and pieces like this, that was how you celebrated notable achievements back in the 15th, 16th, going into the 17th centuries. Um, paintings began, began to be more and more common. Um, things like medallions and jewellery and plates of silver and stuff tended to fall out of... Um, preference a little bit towards the end of that period as for why it's not more celebrated um 
It, it depends, really. I mean, it's a bit weird for me to see that. I, I can see where you're coming from, but I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask in some respects on that, because as, a, as someone who's been interested in naval history from, like, shortly after I could actually walk unassisted... Um, I've always known about the Armada, and it's always held a fairly important place in, in my memory of naval history. There have been various commemorations of it. There was a big beacon lighting ceremony a few years ago on the however many hundred years it's been since the Armada um, anniversary, so that was pretty spectacular. I think I think the, the difference is actually depending on the for some of the battles that you list some of it's down to legitimate um memory and how critical things were and some of it's also down to propaganda so agincourt was a notable english victory that is to be certain um and it it, it was fairly spectacular uh, certainly definitely against the odds uh, at least as how they appeared to the people at the time. However, there were other fairly spectacular English victories in the Hundred Years' War, like Cressy and Poitiers, um, and so on and so forth. But the reason, to be perfectly honest, the reason that Agincourt holds so much of a place in the collective memory of the England and Britain as a whole is largely down to Shakespeare deciding to make it the centerpiece of one of the one of his plays on Henry V. Um if he hadn't then who knows it may it may still be somewhat celebrated but I don't think it would be celebrated quite as much without Henry without Shakespeare putting it into Henry V. Um El Alamein these days I mean it's still a notable victory but it's it's more noted as being a a turning point in World War Two, much the same actually as the Battle of Britain. Um, but the Battle of Britain obviously has a bit more direct relevance and is a bit is is certainly a lot more well known because it was fought directly in the skies over Britain, and uh, the the common sort of parlance for it is that it, it it is what stopped the Germans attempting to invade. I mean, we've gone over Operation Sea Line numerous times, so let's not get into that particular argument. But that's certainly the the, the default easy view, and it, it's still a fairly spectacular victory. But El Alamein and the Battle of Britain do hold one key common thing in common, which is that it's a point where it shows that the German war machine can be defeated. Prior to that, remember the Luftwaffe had swept the skies of Poland. They pretty much swept the skies of France. And so for them to be stopped and turned back in the Battle of Britain, it showed that actually, no, the Luftwaffe can be defeated. The same with El Alamein. The Germans had swept through Poland. They'd swept through France. They'd shown up in North Africa. I mean, they'd, they'd punched their way through most of Eastern Europe at this point as well. They'd come up into, into North Africa. They'd punched their way through there. El Alamein was kind of, very, well, El Alamein wasn't quite the absolute last gasp, but it certainly was on the string of a, on the tail end of a long string of defeats to Rommel, but it showed that actually the German military, uh, the, the ground forces, again, could be defeated, could be turned back wholesale. Um, obviously, everyone's had local defeats and victories here, there, and everywhere. But on a grand strategic scale, that's the turning point that El Alamein is. And also, to a certain degree, you've also got to remember El Alamein and the Battle of Britain are still just about within living memory. And for obviously the the prior to this have have been in living memory. So there is a certain amount of build up on that as well. Um, it's much easier to celebrate something when you can sort of sit someone down and say, what was it like? How was it to be there, etc. And it's one of the sad things to reflect on, actually, that when I was a when I was a kid, and I'm not that old, but when I was a kid, finding a World War One veteran, it it wasn't easy. But it also wasn't too difficult. If you had a, a generic kind of circle of family friends, you could probably find, oh yeah, that such and such a chap, he was in 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 the trenches or in the navy or more rarely in the royal flying corps in world war one the and 
almost every other person with grey hair, you could probably <laughs> say, oh, yes, you were in World War II, weren't you? Um, now all the World War I veterans are gone, and there aren't that many World War II veterans left either, which is, yeah, it's, it's actually quite a sobering turn of events in what's actually a relatively short span of time. But uh, I digress. Um, Waterloo, it is a turning point in that it finally puts the nail in the coffin of Napoleon's ambitions, but it's also, to a, a certain degree, a product, a large product of propaganda, both in terms of just how much of a role the Prussians actually play in it, um, <laughs> depending on which particular account you read, and also because Napoleon had been blown up to be like this massive threat to everything. So to see him defeated and put down, at least uh, at least for the British, um, it was was a big thing. To um, if you if you built up this enemy, then when you take him down, it's like the grand finale. Um, Trafalgar actually legitimately is, I think, it is legitimately celebrated as a properly um, epic making victory. Uh, pun intended, given the flagship, but that that's because not only does it completely scupper Napoleon's hopes of invading England, because unlike Hitler, Napoleon actually had a half-decent chance of pulling off a successful invasion if he could gain control of the Channel, and he had a much better chance of gaining control of the Channel with a combined Franco-Spanish fleet than Hitler ever did. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's not to say the French and Spanish fleets didn't remain threats. They did, but this that battle kind of broke their last big seagoing fleet that had a reasonable chance of pulling anything off. After that, they were kind of forced by blockade to be split up into smaller squadrons, which never really had much of a chance to coalesce or operate together as a whole unit. But anyway, the other thing was it, it gave the British the ascendancy that would result in Pax Britannica in the rest of the 19th and early 20th centuries the battle of trafalgar did really mark a turning point during the during the napoleonic wars and before britain had been one of the top powers but it had been one of the top powers by constantly having to basically use its economic power to pay a bunch of other people to fight whoever they were fighting on land as well as taking the war to them at sea um so if you kind of like to use the 19th century great power illustration, Britain was at the top end of the great powers table, but it very definitely was not preeminent because, well, the Napoleonic War showed just who was preeminent on land in, in Europe for a good chunk of <laughs> the latter part of the 18th century anyway. But yeah. And after Trafalgar, once that was kind of, that was the end of the f big formal naval threat and uh as long as blockade operations were kept up and it, it segued into britain being just the top power so that that's definitely worth uh, the celebrations and the remarks that it gets i think the armada i think weirdly enough even though the armada is probably the closest to an existential threat that england dash britain has faced in several hundred years in fact almost a millennia um the i mean you've got the glorious revolution but they were invited <laughs> the armada definitely wasn't except by maybe a very very few um so the armada is probably the closest thing closest that england's come to being invaded in reasonable living mem uh, well not living memory but reasonable history um and so its defeat, you'd think, should be yeah preeminent because well, that's that's the big threat, and also, um, Britain was very much you know, well, England was very much the underdog in that fight. <laughs> Spain was the big power. Um, Britain was very much lower down the pecking order than Spain, and yet it managed to well survive. <laughs> shall we say? The less said about the English Armada, the better. I think when I do my when I eventually get around to doing a video on the Spanish Armada, I will have to follow up with a video on the English Armada for fair and balanced purposes, because that didn't go particularly well. Um, but yes, I think it's 
I think, to be honest, it's a combination of because of the way it was commemorated at the time, there isn't any any immediate permanent statuary in somewhere like London where from kind of, oh, yes, that. OK, well, we know what that is. Um, and just time. It's been hundreds and hundreds of years since the Armada. Um, it's OK, fair enough. It's been just over 200 years since Trafalgar, but Trafalgar has been kept up and alive in in memory for a fair bit of time and to be honest weirdly enough Trafalgar's not that far away from living memory um I actually thought about this once because I realized that you know I know it sounds a little bit like a degrees of Kevin Bacon game but people who were around at the time of Trafalgar actually survived remarkably long periods of time I mean the Duke of Wellington wasn't exactly young at the time of Trafalgar to use a, a, a famous man example but he chugged along well into the well just about I should say into the second half of the 19th century now people are my, like my grandparents were born in the late 20s early 30s it's only about 80 years difference between the death of the Duke of Wellington and the the birth of say someone that, like the generation that my grandparents are from and when you t I say when you take into account the fact that the duke of wellington was not exactly a spring chicken at the time of trafalgar there would have been people sort of boys and young men who were at trafalgar who would have outlasted even him and so like i know my grandfather it's entirely possible that he would have known been able to speak to someone when he was a boy who was old enough to themselves have spoken to a living veteran of Trafalgar. That's actually quite the spectacular thought. That's what, two degrees of separation from something that we really generally think of something that occurs in a painting. But when you go to something like the Armada, nah, that, that's, that, that, there's a lot of degrees of separation going back to the Armada, I'm afraid. So yeah, th those would be my thoughts, and this is probably the longest single answer in this episode of The Dry Dock, so I hope you forgive my rambling. Let's go to another nice interlude, shall we? Corvus asks, I've noticed in Drydock 96 in the answer about the duties of midshipmen, you pronounce the next rank up as lieutenant. I had the impression that was a British Army affectation and that the Royal Navy is pronounced the proper way, lieutenant. Is this impression incorrect or like everything in life, is it complicated? Oh, this is a little bit of a minefield, isn't it? Well, as far as I can tell, no one in the Royal Navy uses lieutenant. There's lieutenant. Um, which is used um, and of course in the army and the RAF it's definitely lieutenant um, but um, ha having spoken to uh, another YouTuber who was formerly in the Royal Navy and uh, obviously has been used to lieutenant um, I've also spoken to a couple of other people um, in from the Navy or who know a lot about specifically Royal Navy history and pronunciation and it's a little bit all over the place. Um, I think, as far as I can tell, Lieutenant is standard kind of at the moment um, in the Royal Navy, which is different to Lieutenant. Um, and then further back in history, whether they were using Lieutenant or Lieutenant seems to be a little bit up in the air. I've had, I found some references that seem to indicate Lieutenant, others that say Lieutenant. Um, nothing that says lieutenant, um, uh, unless you watch too much Star Trek, but, um, yeah, so it's all a little bit open up in the air. Um, basically I went with lieutenant to, because I have a feeling that if I'm going through and obviously the spelling is all the same. Um, so I have a feeling if I'm going through and I'm trying to say lieutenant, I'm probably going to slip into lieutenant 
and then I am going to get it in the neck from anyone who's ever served in the Royal Navy because that one's definitely wrong. At least if I go with Lieutenant, I'm only partly wrong. <laughs> Possibly. Who knows? Serving an ex-Royal Navy members, please feel free to start an argument in the comments below. <laughs> Christopher Whitmer asks, what would be the best battle or battles to study to understand naval tactics and formations for a writer writing fiction? Are there any tactics you would recommend in a general sense? Um, it depends almost entirely on the kind of setting you've got in fiction, because naval tactics vary so much depending on the technology of the guns, the technology of the ships, the crews in terms of their experience and their general naval culture. You can have tactics centered around boarding, you can have tactics centered around long range gunnery, short range gunnery, highly aggressive maneuvering, static maneuvering, battle lines, loose formations, and everything in between. Um, so a tactic that will work in one scenario will be absolutely disastrous in another scenario. And even within a particular setting, a tactic can be excellent or utterly suicidal, depending on who's carrying it out. So, for example, let's take breaking the enemy's line. At Trafalgar, Nelson pulls it off brilliantly because, flat out, the Royal Navy is better at fighting at sea than the French and Spanish navies are. If that situation had been flipped around, if Nelson had 33 ships strung out in a line and the Franco-Spanish fleet was approaching him in two columns, they would have been slaughtered where they stood as they crawled towards him because of the differences in quality of the British gunnery versus the Franco-Spanish gunnery. And as I say, that's within the same setting. So crossing the T or deliberately putting yourself in a position to cross the T normally being the one who's having your tea crossed is disastrous but that may not apply depending as i say based on the the cultural setting of the of the navy at the time and their training levels so yeah i mean if you want to drop me a line by email and tell me roughly what kind of setting you're looking at and sort of maybe what historical period it most closely resembles then i can definitely give you some pointers on on tactics that work in that period um and it's pretty much the same thing for the best battle or battles to study naval tactics and formations. Um, if you can, if you can withstand digging into it, uh, into all the charts and everything, the Battle of Jutland is actually excellent for formations because they go through so many. Um, something like the Battle of Lissa is interesting because it has some rather unorthodox tactics and formations in it. Um, so yeah, there's there's a number of different battles, but again, it comes down to setting. If you're trying to understand naval tactics and formations, you need to understand them for for a particular era, because the bat the tactics that work at Jutland won't work at Midway. The bat tactics at Lissa won't work at Trafalgar. The tactics at Trafalgar won't work at Jutland, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, F feel free to drop me a line by email or on Discord and basically give me a, a setting, either the setting of, of the fiction or this real life setting that you want to vaguely model it off of and, and then I'll be able to give you a much more precise answer. Christian B asks, weight saving on HMS Nelson and all other main guns forward ships. Why not have one single elongated or oval barbette for all turrets with just internal splinter protection instead of individual ones? I would imagine this would save even more weight than just shortening the main belt. It depends how your guns are laid out. Um, for something like, say, some of the Japanese heavy cruisers, where they have uh, the guns packed in really tight, so you've got uh, the second turret super firing over the first and then the third turret backed right up onto the second. In that case, yeah, you probably would save a bit of weight by making a, making a single large barbette. With something like the Richelieu's, <clears throat> where the two quad turrets are actually relatively spaced apart, or indeed the Nelson's, where the turrets are relatively spaced and especially C turret is well back from B turret, you'll actually be uh, 
in terms of surface area, a single continuous barbette would actually end up weighing more because it would cover more distance. That said, there is also one other big problem with just having internal splinter divide, and that is if a shell penetrates a barbette, which is obviously bad news anyway, but if that happens, with individual barbettes, the worst case scenario is... Well, the most reasonable worst case scenario is you lose that turret. I mean, obviously, absolute worst case scenario, somehow the magazine goes up, but <clears throat> yeah, um, a barbette penetration to a single turret, possibly you lose the turret permanently for the battle or temporarily, depends on the shell, depends what it does, but the other turrets will continue to operate. If you have one single continuous barbette and just splinter protection internally, if a shell penetrates that barbette, there's a very good chance you lose your entire main battery, um, at least temporarily, possibly possibly far, uh, far longer than that. And obviously, there's three times the shell hoists, in the Nelson's case, twice the shell hoist, in the Richelieu's case, twice the risk or three times the risk that something catches fire and everything goes up in a bang. So, yeah. It... it it would save weight in certain ships. It wouldn't save weight in other ships, but the risks to losing your all your main battery and possibly your entire ship go up very, very much to a point that the two things mitigate against trying it. Um, I say, unless maybe with with some of those Japanese heavy cruisers, they might have saved some weight by doing it. Um, and well, a shell that's going to make it through their belt armor and their barbette armor is probably going to make it detonate or just badly cripple the ship anyway so there may be a marginal case to be made there but own that's very niche and let's say it's still only marginal thomas farley asks in part one of your horatio nelson video you mentioned that he was given a commission as a colonel of the marines in addition to his royal navy commission what does this mean in historical context was it common and knowing of the long-term rivalry between the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, it seems unlikely that an officer could ever have held ranks in both organisations. So it does seem a little bit odd. So for most of its history in the various armed services of the United Kingdom, the title of colonel has, to varying degrees, been something of what they call a sinecure position, or uh, basically a position that doesn't actually do all that much. That Now, that has varied, Um at some points they were actually responsible for particularly in the army regiments and post sort of post the victorian period they the rank was actually also given a, a a proper official role within the armed forces but for large portions of armed service history the rank of colonel of or colonel of this colonel of that has been more of an honor an honorific that happens to also be paid <laughs> than it has been an actual sort of battlefield command role in particular colonel of the marines it has always been an honorific position that the royal navy the, and the royal marines can grant it doesn't actually give you any particular authority over the regular rank and file royal marines but it is a way of acknowledging your service and your commitment to things. So, yeah, it was basically just kind of like, here, have a, have a nice little separate bit of pay and uh, a nice title, thanks to your courageous actions. Um, it could be it could be bestowed... It wasn't common, but it also wasn't massively uncommon. And the other thing you have to remember is that whilst there is always a degree of friendly rivalry between various armed services, the degree of rivalry between the Royal Marines and the Royal Navy is nothing like the um, <laughs> occasional antipathy, shall we say, between the US Navy and the Marine Corps. I mean, apart from anything, the Royal Marines do generally tend to understand that if they want to go to interesting places and blow them up, they do actually need the Navy for the ride. <laughs> The U the US Marine Corps, on the other hand, seems to have almost almost its own little air force, its own little army, and its own little navy, so go figure. And although they probably still depend on the US Navy for rides, uh, they probably resent you telling them that. <laughs> Rafael Jaztek, I think, sorry. Um 
asks, how do Polish Grom class destroyers compare to other nations destroyers when they were commissioned and at the end of the war? Complete random side note, and this may just be me being a bit weird, but whenever I see the name uh, Grom class destroyers, I don't know, for some reason mentally I, I want to stand there like an orc at the Battle of the Pelennor Fields and except instead of yelling Grom, I just want to go Grom, Grom, Grom. Um, I may be tired. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the Grom class, when they are commissioned, they're actually pretty darn powerful. Um they're very heavily armed for destroyers. They're pretty large for destroyers. They're also very fast. Um, they've got a decent torpedo set. It's like, what's not to like? Um, they're not perhaps the world's best anti-submarine destroyers, but, well, they're quite obviously fleet destroyers, so that's probably not necessarily um, a massive black mark against them. And, of course, as with almost all uh, destroyers of the period, they're commissioned pretty light on the anti-aircraft capabilities especially in terms of direct self-defense um but again that's not a massive mark against them because outside of the u.s ships lucky enough to be armed with the dual purpose versions of the five inch 38 <laughs> to a greater or less degree kind of applies to almost everybody um but yeah as fleet destroyers they're certainly they're certainly pretty good top of the line units um by any estimation by the end of the war um destroyers generally speaking had caught up in size or in cases like the gearings um and such like overtaken them so their arm had very heavy armament at the start of the war in terms of guns wasn't quite so unusual towards the end of the war although they were still very well armed um Torpedo-wise, he neither here nor there. Um, the torpedo armament um, was serviceable at the beginning, still serviceable at the end. Obviously, they gained a few. Well, Bliskovica and gained a few um, additional AA guns over the course of time, and of course was also refitted with dual four-inch guns, which slightly lessened the anti-surface fire power, even though they gained an extra gun. Um, but did mean that its anti-aircraft capabilities increased quite dramatically. So. I mean, the, the the main thing is that any destroyer that was in active service in most navies um, at the beginning of the war, it was going to be pretty worn out by the end of the war. But that that's just an operational thing as opposed to a capabilities, strictly capabilities related thing. Um, and of course, being a pre-war destroyer, it wouldn't have been designed for the massive increase in anti-aircraft weapons, radar, and other sensors, etc., but by the end of the war, I say it's still relatively competitive. Um, so certainly not something you turn your back on in a hurry. And yeah, with the with the uh, the twin four inch, it was a pretty good, decent all round destroyer. Um, what it lacked for what the four inch lacked for in throw weight, it made up for the fact that there were eight of them. So yeah, they, they, they were still pretty good by the end of the war. Tom Harper, nineteen ninety seven. Ask, can you please give a brief overview of Operation Wikinger and exactly how such a deadly friendly fire incident came to pass? Um, I actually answered that question in Dry Dock episode 96, just over two and a half hours in, so I will refer you to that Dry Dock. The Hand of Ray asks, what are your top personal favourite military uniforms and flag designs from history? I'm going to horribly cheat here and go with late 14th early 15th century armor um as a military uniform um especially once you add a dupon or surcoat to it because and yes that is me and yes that is a real suit of armor and yes i have fought in it and yes there is video uh but yes um <laughs> it's 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 just so good uh both to wear and it's shiny it's shiny and protective, and people don't tend to mess with you when you look like a slightly smoother Terminator walking towards them. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that that would be pretty much my all-time favourite military uniform. Um, if you had to, if you're going to box me into a corner and force me to choose an actual like mass-issued uniform, I'm actually quite partial to the rifle regiments green uniforms from the Napoleonic era. Um, that may also be sharp talking. 
<laughs> I was a little bit of a devotee of that series. Um, and in terms of flags, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to the medieval heraldry flags. Yeah, they're a bit more complicated, but they look so much cooler than, well, let's face it, these days an awful lot of flags are just variations on a horizontal or vertical tree color. Um, there's very few that don't follow that. Um, and yeah, medieval heraldry flags on a battlefield look so much better. And so did the royal standards, to be honest, as well. Stuart asks, if the US Navy had gone through with modernizing the Pennsylvania and Tennessee class armored cruisers, as was proposed in the 1920s, would these units have had relevant combat power in World War II, assuming that they weren't scrapped due to London Naval Treaty caps on heavy cruiser, treaty, heavy cruiser tonnage? Probably not, to be perfectly honest. Um, there was a whole argument as to whether or not you could, we should upgrade or replace their guns. But either way, their fire, their main gun firepower would be considerably less than a modern armored cruiser with eight, uh, with eight or nine modern eight-inch guns. Their belt armor, yeah, okay, it's five inches. Yes, that's more than most armored crew, uh, most heavy cruisers. But still, it's not. I mean, it's all right against eight-inch gunfire at long range, and it's certainly pretty good against six-inch gunfire. But if it's going to get tangled up firing. With modern armor, uh, modern heavy or light cruisers, um, they can get close enough to punch through that armor, and it's marginal uh, against eight-inch gunfire. The, the the other thing, with the best will in the world, even with a modernized power plant, they're not going to be fast enough, and that that ties back to the previous engagement scenario. You could you could get them up to somewhere between maybe twenty six twenty eight knots, depending on how much extra, how much modern power plant uh, wise you're willing to shove down into the machinery spaces. But ultimately, these hulls were designed for lower speeds, and that is a major problem when it comes to upping speeds. A, a hull that's designed for very high speed regimens, like twenty eight thirty plus knots, you can push a fair way up the speed regimen before the hull form starts to become unsuitable but when you're talking about hull shapes that are designed for low 20s pushing much above that you just you'd end up hydroplaning the thing um, before long the, the hull's just not designed for that kind of drag and hydrodynamic environment so if they're limited let's split the difference say 27 knots well what are you going to use them for they can't run from enemy heavy cruisers and at, with that kind of speed difference an enemy heavy cruiser or even a light cruiser can close them down to a distance where they won't have any trouble penetrating their armor they're not going to have as many heavy um, heavy guns as a uh, bond heavy cruiser they can't keep up with carrier formations they can barely keep up with battleships maybe they can keep up with the north carolinas because of their engine problems or the standards um so yeah as a frontline combatant no they they're just it's not it's not something that's worth having around about the only place they might have some kind of use would be if you stripped out the entirety of the secondary battery and replaced it with 20 mils 40 mils and 5 inch 38s and basically turned them into a kind of light version, light anti-aircraft heavy cruiser. You might get some use out of them then because then they could follow the standards around as basically an AA picket and occasional shore bombardment vessel. They do pretty well in the shore bombardment role actually because, well, five inches of armor will probably defeat most stuff that sh shore batteries that the Japanese have can throw at them. Um, and the slightly fewer... Um, heavy guns won't matter too much in that scenario but yeah that they, they would have utility but i wouldn't say relevant combat power they'd probably both be in the same boat as and be paired with something like uss arkansas john rees asks a bit of a random question but i was listening to public service broadcasting song lit up the song features samples of lieutenant 
the Lieutenant Commander Thomas Woodruff's drunken ramble to the BBC during the 1937 Spithead Review, I was just wondering if there have been any other comedic PR gaffes at important naval events. Well, of course, there's the 1897 Spithead Naval Review, where Turbina went running around and rather embarrassed uh, the Royal Navy's destroyers and torpedo uh, boat destroyers by outrunning them all as they desperately tried to chase it down. And then, of course, you've got the US President and several federal secretaries visiting the USS Princeton in 1844 and then having one of its guns explode, killing the Secretary of State, the Secretary of the Navy, and several other high-ranking officials. That's uh, something of an embarrassing gaffe at a relatively important naval event. It's just lucky the President was below decks. Um, you've also got the fact that Musashi, the Japanese battleship, was so large um, that when it was launched, they kind of forgot about the size of the launching area and, uh, well, flooded part of Nagasaki with the uh, stern wave. <laughs> that, that's, that's a bit of an embarrassment, especially since because it was all supposed to be hush-hush and quiet, the, um, shall we say, that the, the Japanese didn't really admit to it, so the residents were generally left to wonder, why Why is my home under six feet of water? And that brings us to the end of the formal Sunday section of this month's Patreon Dry Dock. The, at the point that this is released, there will, of course, have been the Friday live stream section for the Dry Dock, Patreon Dry Dock, which will cover the sort of alternate history and speculative aspects of questions that have been asked. So uh, hopefully you caught that, and if not, there is a playlist of live streams for you to go and have a look at. The only other couple of things to mention are, one, that there is a petition being circulated and link in the video description below. And I don't normally, obviously, <laughs> encourage people to go off and sign petitions, but this one, well, some of you may have heard of HMS Bristol. She's a Type 82 destroyer. She was going to be the lead ship of a class designed to escort uh, the old CVA-01 aircraft carriers that end up getting cancelled, and she's scheduled to be decommissioned and scrapped after having spent quite a long time as a harbour training and accommodation ship in Portsmouth. Uh, in that wonderful way of Britain not actually preserving many warships, so yes, as you might guess, this petition is, uh, yeah, we'd rather you didn't scrap her and maybe turn her into a museum ship, please, thank you. Um, which I think is probably, at least for a channel like this, a worthy cause to promote. So if you fancy adding your signature to that petition, as I say, link in the video description below. And just a couple of bits or other quick bits. Um, firstly is you've got one more week on the 150k subscribers dash million views on the USS Texas video dash 100 dry dock episodes giveaway um, on uh, yeah the giveaway survey uh, survey link in the video description for dry dock episode 100 and the only other thing thing that's probably left to announce is that on the 22nd of July I will be going in for some minor surgery. Um, there's projected to be a couple of two to three weeks recovery period. I don't think it's going to massively affect my output for the channel. Uh, I'm going to try and get stocked up ahead of time just in case at least for the first week while I'm working my way off the anaesthetic maybe both. About the only thing that might affect is the Patreon Dry Dock live stream for the end of July. Hopefully I'll be in a decent enough shape at that point in recovery to conduct the live stream, even if it might be a sort of slideshow live stream instead of direct live stream. But we'll see how that goes. Um, it's nothing major, just a bit of uh, minor surgery, but it involves general anaesthetic and such so um yeah you never know we we shall see how it goes anyway um i've survived worse <laughs> a lot worse actually but there you go that's another story anyway thank you very much for listening if indeed you still are reaching the end of this uh two and almost two and three quarter hour patreon dry dock so see you again in another video